Okay, let's go ahead and get started. Welcome everybody. My name is Don Klemmer. I'm a sales engineer at Parallels and we're going to be going through advanced technical training today for Parallels Remote Application Server. Uh, this is our latest and greatest. A um, couple of quick quirks in the WebEx. You are not all by yourself out there. I know you look like you are, but you're not. It's just the way that WebEx works. There's a lot of people out there. Um, also, unfortunately, we need to keep everybody on administrative mute. Otherwise, we'd have all sorts of background noise, static echoes, et cetera, maybe even some hold music, although uh, let's hope not that. Um, so if you do want to ask questions, and I really encourage that you keep this uh, session interactive, please go ahead and um, just use the chat function. I've got that open up on another screen. I'll keep an eye on it. You can use the Q&A function as well. I, I just tend not to see that as quick, but I will get to it. So just go ahead and ask your questions as we go along, and um, I'll do my best to answer them. I'll also leave a little bit of time at the end as well if we need to uh, answer some questions there also. Okay, so just a real quick highlight in the course overview, uh, Parallels for Brez, Advanced Technical Training. We're going to go about four hours today. We're definitely going to take a couple of breaks. Uh, the format today is lecture, demo, lecture, demo. Um, and then the rest of it, of course, is going to be self-study. So stand up Brez, start a free trial, kind of work your way through it. You will have access to the recordings and the documentation, and you can use that to kind of deploy your own test environment. As I said, we are going to make a copy of the slides and the recording, they'll be available to you. And then there is an advanced certification exam um, out there as well. So uh, there are some prerequisites here. Um, these aren't required. So if you feel like you've got some experience with RAS, it's okay. Uh, Please don't get away from this, <laughs> but uh, uh, we do expect that you're going to have some functional experience with remote application server. You've completed the basic training or have some sort of equivalent hands on experience or at least, have, uh, you know, you've installed it and kind of do that. You've got a working knowledge of RAS architecture. Uh, additionally to that, we're expecting that you've got kind of a working knowledge of Active Directory and basic DNS skills and a little bit actually in Azure. We're going to be doing a few things with Azure, too, although I will walk you through some of that. Although um, that would also would be good background to have as well. Again, if you don't have all this, go ahead and attend the training. Um, we're not metering it or controlling it anyway, but uh, just things we really recommend. Okay, and there's no formal uh, training material for this course. However, there is plenty of documentation for it. All our online resources is at HTTP colon parallels.com slash product slash RAS slash support. I honestly just browse to it. Usually I go to parallels.com. That's easy enough to remember. And then I click on support and then choose the product. And then uh, right there is our online knowledge base. So I'm going to be referencing several knowledge base articles through this. And then if you scroll down all the way to the bottom of that page, scroll, 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 you'll find the, um, that's where you'll find links to our technical documentation. The administrator guide is very useful. There's also a solutions guide, best practices, printing best practices, all sorts of stuff. It's got all the detail there that you'll need. Okay, and moving on, the agenda today. Well, we're kind of partway through the introduction and overview already, uh, but the technical topics we're going to be quite, uh, covering today are quite ex uh, extensive. As we can see them here. We're going to start off with Windows uh, Virtual Desktop, and then we'll get into multi-tenancy and the tenant broker. We'll talk about load balancing on Azure and Amazon Web Services. We're going to go through SAML, troubleshooting and log details, and then there's a bunch of additional features as well. Uh, Microsoft Azure VDI and RDSH provisioning. Google Authenticator, I want to show that, how that uh, OTP passwords or um, two-factor authentication works. I'm going to show you a few other features that people overlook and don't use very often, such as the administrator folders for publishing, permissions delegations, and then there's a bunch of more um, fairly new features in there that I also want to cover. And then, of course, at the end, we're going to wrap up and do some questions. A lot of these videos, or they are actually a lot of this, I have pre-recorded as video. Um, and the reason for that is particularly when you're doing SAML or WVD, I mean, they, they can take an hour and a half, two hours or so just amongst themselves. And a lot of that time is just sit there waiting for things to provision in Azure and elsewhere. So I actually pre-recorded those videos, but I'm going to live narrate over them. So I'm right here with you today. Uh, we're going to live narrate, ask questions as we go through. Um, I just sped up the video in places and cut some things out just so we wouldn't have to sit there and watch status bars go. And like I said, uh, the wrap up is kind of at the end of the questions, but please ask questions as we go through so we can make this a little bit more interactive. And then the one marketing slide I always throw up here, I promise it's the only one, is despite all these new features and all the new functionality that we keep adding in parallels, there's still just the one cost, the one license model. There is no advanced enterprise platinum plus data center edition. Everything is included. 
we license purely by concurrent user. That's really the only way we do things. And so you're entitled to go to the latest and greatest and grab all these new features as needed. And uh, that also includes support and access, obviously, to the free training and documentation and all of that. So we no price changes for this. Everything's included that I talk about. The only other additional cost that you might incur would be for other software or running it in Azure or AWS or something. Okay, and then here's the exam information. If you just go to the Parallels Partner Portal and log in, you'll have access to the exam. There's a sales certification exam. There's our regular certification exam. And there is also an advanced certification exam as well. If you're not a partner and you're wondering what exam am I talking about, I wouldn't worry about it. It's not an industry industry exam. It's just an exam for our partners to make sure that uh, they're certified that when they go talk to our joint customers that they know what they're talking about. Um, again, all of this material will be available to you. Uh, there's going to be a follow up email, which will have links about how to take the exam, um, get into the partner portal. There also will be um, it have links to a Dropbox that I maintain that will have a copy of this recording and the slides and any other documentation out there that you require. Okay, so let's talk, start talking about Windows Virtual Desktop or WVD. Uh, this obviously is a Microsoft Azure initiative. It only works in Azure. It's uh, kind of their Windows desktop virtualization direction in a way, I guess, kind of. It certainly doesn't replace some of their traditional methods. It's more of an add-on just up on Azure. Uh, but I think most people would be interested in is you can run Windows 10 in multi-user mode. Parallels has added some integration with this. So um, we kind of integrate with it up on Azure and that kind of brings the benefits of, I guess, both capabilities. You get kind of some of the back ends work from Microsoft WVD. And then on the parallel side, of course, you can enhance and extend the parallels implementation that you're already using and then take advantage of a lot of things that we provide, obviously, such as the brokering, the universal printing and scanning, uh, the pre-launch capabilities that we have, the integration that we've added in with FX Logic. Um, and the image optimizations. I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that later. And then, of course, the security policies for the clients, leveraging and monitoring, and uh, all sorts of the usual goodness that Parallels brings. So, if we take a look at the architect, it is very much um, based on Microsoft's own stuff up in Azure. They've got their own way of doing it, their own way of deploying it. We can't just unfortunately integrate and deploy it just like we would a remote desktop server, right? Wouldn't that be just easy if we could just pick that and do it? But nope, <laughs> they've got their own, own implementation up there. And so we're going to have to integrate with that. So there's a couple of layers of this to kind of get it to working. Um, one of the things that we must do, of course, is we can run in single or multi-session uh, WVD host, but that means we're going to have to lay down two different agents on it. We've got to have a desktop agent to treat it as a desktop, and at the same time, a management agent, like uh, we would add on a remote desktop server for the WVD server or host, I guess. Kind of hard to think of Windows 10 as a server, for instance, but um, we would add both of those on there, and that allows us to kind of manage it in both ways at once. It's a little bit different in that regard. Um, the other thing, too, and this is a bit of a Microsoft limitation just to kind of keep in mind, is that it only works using the Parallels client for Windows. And that, again, is because we're brokering and doing the connection, but we're also having to hand it off to the WVD desktop as well. So because of that, uh, you can really only use the Parallels client for Windows in order to get this to work. So if you're coming from a Mac, you're not going to be able to use WVD. If you want to use the HTML5 only interface or an iPad or something like that, again, you're going to have to go with the Parallels client. That's just kind of a Microsoft limitation. There's some a lot of steps to this because we do have to run it up on Azure and we do have to integrate in there with it. We've got some knowledge base articles that will allow you to walk you kind of through this. Uh, the first one is what we call it the prerequisites, but it's really just walking you through the Azure side, you know, what you have to do up in the Azure um, ED, register your apps, set the permissions and so forth. There's a follow on document there for configuration. Um, we'll walk you through that. And the one resource I don't want you to forget about, too, is the admin guide. The pre rack document in particular and a little bit of the configuration document, but they assume you know a little something about Azure. And if they just show you pictures, you'll instantly be able to browse and go there. 
It is possible if you're not super familiar with it, that you can be going right down that prerequisites document and then kind of get lost. Um, like, where does this go? What is that step? We seem to have jumped here. It's just an assumption that was made that, you know, you're kind of familiar with Azure. It's not our product. That's part of why it was done that way. However, the administrator guide has a lot more detail. It doesn't have all the pictures, but it's got a lot more detail. So if you're going down one of these other two knowledge base articles and then you kind of get lost a little bit, switch over to the admin guide and pull that up as a reference. And that will often bridge the gaps. In fact, it will just about always bridge the gaps. So kind of keep that up there as well. And between those, you should be able to not have too much trouble to get through this. And then the final knowledge base article is there are some client side requirements. I talked about Windows, but um, Windows clients rather, but also if you're going to be, uh, there's some other requirements on there as well. Generally, a fully patched Windows 10 should work, but if you're connecting from an older Windows client, such as say Windows 7, there may be a couple other things that you've got to do. Okay, and then as we kind of go through some of these requirements and tips real quick, just ahead of the demo, keep in mind that uh, if you're going to use wanted to use Windows 7 WVD, that's not supported by RAS. We're doing purely Windows 10 at this point. Um, we do recommend that, you know, if you're going to be managing WVD within RAS, you keep managing WVD within RAS. Don't switch over and try to man manually manage it on the Azure side. That can break things and break the link between Parallels and Microsoft Azure on, as far as the WVD is concerned. So it could make you lose that WVD host. There are ways to recover from that. There's some knowledge base articles there and support, of course, can help, but it's best just not to get in that in the first place. So if you're going to use WVD with Parallels, manage that WVD instances with, with Parallels. And then, of course, I did mention it's going to require just the Parallels client for Windows only. That's just kind of the nature of the beast in terms of where we are. And also keep your Azure subscription information handy right in front of you. Because you can see from the screenshot, we are going to be having to add in a lot of this information here. Um, Part of it's already filled out for you. That's the subscription details, but the rest of it, uh, you're going to have to do some copy and paste. And as I'm talking about that, I got to say that copy and paste the functionality now the, the IDs down here and the keys are a little finicky. Um, it can be kind of hard. You can't just have your cursor sitting in there and then get a nice copy and paste. What I was doing was just doing the tab. So I'd kind of have my uh, cursor up there in the name, get that typed in, tab down to uh, description, credentials, and then tab down to the uh, tenant ID. And then that would create like a little blue box there. It doesn't look like it fills up all the dashes. It just fills up the first dash. But if you just leave it there and then just simply do a paste, don't, don't click around in it, but just leave it there and then do a paste. It'll properly paste in the IDs. So that's my little uh, pro tip for this because it is a little bit finicky, I was finding. Uh, this part, as I mentioned, the uh, subscription details should be pre-populated, so you shouldn't have to worry about that part, at least filling it in. The tenant ID and the subscription ID, well, those are just your Azure identification keys, right? So those are up to you. You guys should have those and know where to get those. The application ID, this is the actual application ID itself. You're going to be generating, as you create this, a secret key um, for this application ID, and the secret key has its own ID. Every everything up on Azure, every little entity up there is going to have its own ID. So if you grab the secret key, which you need to grab, don't forget to get that when you're, you're going through the knowledge base uh, article for the prereqs. Remember, it's got the key itself, and then it's got the ID. That ID is not what you want to plug in here. You actually want to plug in the WV ID when you create that. And then the secret key, that goes in here. Um, again, this is kind of in the knowledge base articles and in the admin guide, but I just wanted to call that out a little bit uh, more, just so we kind of have that. Okay, and with that, let's go ahead and switch over and see this in action. Okay, so I've got a pre-built RAS environment ready to go. It's fully functional. I'm just going to go ahead and take advantage of the start wizard to get us going here, though. Okay, and the first step is to enable the feature. It's actually disabled by default. You can do it through the wizard here, or if you go to farm settings, so there's a features tab, you can enable it there, which will take you right here. Generally, you'd want to put it on the publishing agent unless you need to redistribute it for some reason. Uh, then we'll need to download the agent itself. And then the feature set, there's standard, which is um, just the standard WVD features, advanced ads, and a lot of the RAS features like printer redirection and so forth that you uh, can very find very useful. And then there's also a, a fallback where it'll try the RAS advanced and then go back to the standard if you need to. 
And since it's already downloaded, I'll just click next, which takes us to the provider page. This is the Azure integration. So you give it a name, WVD. You can add additional credentials if you like, other than the ones that I'm logged in with. You just click on the little blue plus here. See if I can type this in and then um, it'll just follow the sequential. So go ahead and click OK. And now we need to type the keys. So I'll type in our tenant and subscription IDs, that application ID and the secret key. And then I'll click next and then we'll click finish, which will launch the Windows Virtual Desktop Workspace Wizard. OK, and then in the workspace, we can either create a new workspace or select a thing one. Um, you know, I could browse through here on Azure AD and see what's up there. But let's go ahead and create a new workspace. So I'll just simply call it uh, W or RAS underscore workspace, feeling creative here. And then um, so it's validated. We need to, oh, we need to select a resource group. So I'll do that. And we've got a lot up here. Let's see, I'll search on, um, I don't know, prod. And uh, there we go, eh, Western Europe. Sure, why not? Okay, and that's done. I'll go ahead and click next. And then we'll go ahead and launch the virtual desktop host pool. And we're going to go ahead and um, we can create a pool or select from an existing one. Um, I'm going to go ahead and give it a name. I'll call it WVD Desktops. This is the pool for them. And then go on to next because we're creating a new pool. And there's some different options here. I'm just going to do desktops. The only thing I'll change, go next. Uh, I could do template or standalone. Let's just do standalone to speed things up, which means I need to go find one. Let me search. I'll just type in prod again because I know there's some named that. And here's a few. These are actual virtual desktops, WVDs themselves. I'll pick this one. We'll go next. Here's our Active Directory integration. What I'm doing here is allowing the users that will have the rights to access this. So I'm going to search on the WVD users and add them and click next. And I'm going to skip the optimizations just so we can go a little bit faster here in the setup at least, and then go to next. And then that takes us back to the RAS console. If I go up to farm, you'll see this new item up here, Windows Virtual Desktop. Uh, let me go ahead and click apply. Um, and then we'll let this go ahead and verify and deploy. But here's where you can kind of go in and review a lot of the settings that we just did. You also can deploy the whole thing from here as well using that little blue plus up in the top right. Um, you can see we're installing the agents, it's getting there, and then in just a minute, I'm going to speed this video up quite a bit here. You don't have to wait for all this to deploy out on Azure and talk. There we go, right? And now it's green, green, and we're all good. Okay. Okay, and if we just click on refresh here, uh, we'll go ahead and see that the agent's updated. Okay, so what actually happened on the back end? Let's go back into the Azure portal. Um, and we'll actually go and look at the virtual machine itself. And you'll notice that we added some tags. These tags were added via the API that Raz is calling to talk to them. And um, I also can go look at, uh, I'll type in WED desktops here and click that. And we'll look at the uh, application group and take a look at the assignment here. And you can see the WVD users we pulled up. Um, I'll type in WVD again, and this time go into the, uh, the host pool, and you can see we've got a session host that's actually running in there that's been created and being used, and inside the application group, if you take a look at that, you'll see the RAS tags there as well. Okay, so that's kind of what was done on the Azure side. Um, again, we don't want to make too many changes in these groups and these WVD resources on the Azure side like that because we can interfere with that link between that and RAS. I just wanted to show you what was done. Okay, so let's go back over to our RAS console. And if I go down to publishing and click add, let's go ahead and deploy some resources. I'll do a desktop next. Notice there's a new option here, Windows Virtual Desktop. Next, there it is. That's the one we just provisioned. I'll just give it a friendly name, WVD Desktop, so we know what we're clicking on. And then we'll go ahead and click Finish, and then uh, Apply. And now if I switch back over to my client, and this is again a Windows client, I'll refresh it, and then there's my W10 Desktop just showed up, and I'll go ahead and launch it. And then what's happening is that we are actually um, interacting with the Windows Virtual Desktop service up in Azure. And because remember when we provision this, we set it up as standard, it's going to use the WVD services. So it's going to give us a password prompt right here. If I chose advanced, it makes it a little bit more seamless to the end user and they wouldn't see that. But this way they get to um, 
I said it like that just so we can kind of understand what's happening because we actually are kind of leaving parallels at this point and moving into the WBD service. And, and there's the desktop. I bumped the resolution down so we could see the different windows here. And if I go back over to Azure, uh, we can actually see it. So I'll go to WBD desktops, we'll go to the session hosts, and you can see I've got one active session, and I can even go in and go into the details and drill down a little bit. Um, so it's all right there pulling this up on Azure as you go through. And if I go back to the RAS console, I can actually can see the sessions from here. So again, you don't need to do that. If I just go to virtual desktop, I can see that here's the host that's connected and then under sessions, there's my active users that I've got, right? And then I can look at the show processes. I can kind of manage the whole session from here, just like we, we kind of always do. So it's the same experience we have on a regular traditional stuff. I can send a message, you know, uh, hello, right, to the end users. Send, and then if I go back to the virtual desktop, you can see they get this. So the exact same experience that they get. Okay, let's go ahead and get out of this. Okay, let's go back over to the RAS console and let's do applications this time. So I'll go back to my Windows virtual desktop. I'll go back to the host pools. We'll click on the blue plus. And this time I'll um, we'll do another host right call this one wvd apps next and switch it or keep it i guess an application because that's the default go to next uh, let's do another standalone instead of the template next and then i need to go find a host so i'll go back into the same area i was before that was under prod and i'll pick a different wvd instance there we go and i'll go to next and then i'll add my users that i want to access this so i'll go with wvd uh, users and okay they're in there and next and uh, again i'm going to turn off the uh, optimization just so this will go quicker from a deployment standpoint and next and the deployment's in progress there okay we can go back on the host pool and host and see what's going on it starts off as broken that's just what we're starting to talk to it and it's going to quickly prepare. I sped this part of the clip up dramatically so we wouldn't have to wait. It's not horribly long, but it does take a few minutes to um, install all the agents and get everything verified, get the signaling straight. And there we go. Okay, it's okay. So um, I'll refresh, maybe another refresh. It's still finishing up a few things on the back end while it's doing this. Let's go over to Azure and take a look. So um, here's the session host. Let me go back up into my resource group and I'll type in WBD app, which is the new one we called that'll refresh Azure, and you can see there it is. That's the new one we just created. And if I drill into that, into the host pool, you can see it's there. It's just not quite available just yet. If I go into the application group, um, you can kind of manage the assignments here. You can see there it is to the end user. So it's getting all of this kind of done on the back end for us. And it's just about um, be ready to go in just a minute. Okay, so mostly I just wanted to show you how both sides of the equation because we're interacting with both. Let's go back to the RAS console and let's use this. Let's go into publishing. We'll go down to add. Let's do an application this time, again, from a Windows virtual desktop. Next, uh, very similar, right, to what we're doing before. Installed apps, yep, from here. And then it's going to query the Windows inventory if your app is registered there. And let's see what's on the system. And oh, it's got the Office suite. Let's pick. Um, Let's just grab one. Oh, Word's down here at the bottom. So I'll publish Word. How exciting. Okay, next, next. And there we go. Finish. And then I'll go ahead and click Apply. And then now it's published and available for my end users. So if I go back to my Windows Workstation and refresh my, um, my client here, there's Word. So I can go ahead and launch Word. And again, this is coming from WVDesktop. Desktop. And remember, we left it at standard. So it is going to prompt me again for the password, and this is kind of that handoff back and forth between the WBD system. You can hide a lot of this again by choosing advanced, and remember there's also the advanced with the fallback to this if you have to for whatever reason. Log in, it's starting my app on the desktop and configuring the remote session, and then here we go. There's Office. I'm in Microsoft Word, right? So um, I can launch one of the predefined templates here. It's, again, that very same experience that the end users should be used to in RAS, the seamless window for just Word. Uh, you notice down there it's actually using the Microsoft. If you look at the little icon, it's using the remote app. Um, that's another reason it's Windows only, because Microsoft uses remote app, which only works for Windows. And if I launch IE, that's got the Parallels logo, because that's actually using our own shell. 
So I can kind of bounce back and forth between both, right? And particularly if I had on that advanced um, option instead of the standard, the users would have a very, uh, very seamless experience between uh, WVD and traditional remote desktop services. So they could use RDSH for most things, but perhaps use WV for application compatibility. Okay, so that'll wrap up Windows Virtual Desktops and uh, let's go ahead and move on. Okay, so let's talk about multi-tenancy. Added some very cool multi-tenancy features to version 17.1. And now there's three different ways that we can design a multi-tenant architecture within Parallels Remote Application Server. We can do a logical isolation, we can do a full isolation, and then the new piece for version 17.1 is the tenant broker. If we think about logical separation, it's a very traditional and easy way to do that, right? It's just a single RAS farm. Everybody's running in the same active directory, but I'm centralizing, or, or excuse me, managing where end users end up by using organizational units, GPUs, and then RAS filtering policies, okay? So you have very much a shared infrastructure, and then I'm just doing logical isolation. It's very efficient because we're using the shared infrastructure, right? I don't have to build out quite as much infrastructure with it. I only have to open up one port on the external firewall, and I can have either of my users log into just a single common URL or web page, if you will, that is uh, yours, right? The service provider, you're logging into my environment. Or if I'd like, I can actually give them all a different look and feel just by giving them a slightly different URL, right? You log into this slash URL, you log into that URL with this tag and you get a completely different look and feel. So it feels like they're logging into their own environment. You still just have the one address, public IP address that's open on that, right? And then the Active Directory, as I mentioned, would have to be a shared Active Directory, or if you've got different Active Directories going on, or domains, I guess, would be the way to, better way to put that, uh, there has to be a trusted relationship between them. Very simple. Great for certain environments, provided that you can uh, share infrastructure in, in terms of what you're doing. If this doesn't work, um, because you don't, you do have limited physical isolation here, you actually can take the next step, which is in the complete opposite direction, and go with full isolation. So in this case, I've got separate farms per tenant, and I also have a separate Active Directory infrastructure per tenant, and I have separate IPs per tenant that they're logging into. So I have no bleed over whatsoever. There's absolutely no communication between the farms. I have no shared infrastructure. I have a unique public IP and a unique address for tenants. So I have three openings, if you will, in this example, right? Each tenant has to have their own way into the farm. The good news is that there's no additional parallels licensing cost involved with this, right? Because we license purely by concurrent user. So it doesn't matter if you have one farm or 10 farms or 20 farms, it's just how many users do you have connecting? So this is a very uh, good and powerful way to do things, if you will, just completely isolating the infrastructure. You don't have to worry about bleed over whatsoever. What we've introduced in version 17.1, however, is the concept of tenant broker. If you look at it, it looks very similar to the other environments, right? I've got a shared infrastructure in that middle tier. The, the connection tier, the connection layer, if you will. I've got my load balancers, I've got the RAS gateways out, and I even have some publishing agents out there. But all that does is simply operate inside of the tenant broker. When I get to the actual production systems, if you will, where the end users are doing their work, right? The BDI instance, a terminal server instance, even a remote PC, if you were to go that route, look how those are. Right? Each one has its own active directory and it has no relationship whatsoever with the other tenants. So it is isolated and managed at a physical level at that point. I can even have a firewall that's separating the different tenants so that they can't get out and get through there. Okay? So I've really walled them off. So it's kind of a hybrid approach, right? I've got some shared infrastructure up front in the connection layer and then I've got an isolated resource layer on the back end. And from the public IP perspective, I just have to have that one public IP that's coming in. And then I can either use a common URL or I could give everybody, actually, you couldn't use a common URL. I'm sorry, I'll show you that in the demo. They would each log into their own URL. It could look the same, but they would each have their own URL and that's what would send them uh, to the back end. 
into the correct tenants. So you'd have a unique look and feel for each tenant, although you could duplicate it so it looks the same if you like, but they would have their own URL to get through there. So it kind of combines both, right? I've got physical and active directory isolation. I've got no communication between farms, but I do get to reduce somewhat my physical infrastructure that's required to get in there. So let's take a closer look at this, right? A closer look at exactly how the tenant broker would work. So obviously in the middle there, I've got the tenant broker piece, which has the shared gateways, the load balancer runs at the tenant broker level, right? All that's there. Um, when I look at the tenant itself, look up at tenant one first, I don't actually have to run the gateway and the load balancer at the tenant if I don't want to. There's no need, right? All that work there is happening up at the tenant broker layer. So I don't have to run it there if I don't want to. In fact, in many cases, I think most people probably wouldn't run it there, right? That's part of the reducing infrastructure and sharing the infrastructure piece and getting some of the cost savings there. But if we look at what I'm doing with tenant two here, I can run a separate gateway and load balancer infrastructure down there if I want to, right? Maybe I've got internal users, right? I've got an environment that's kind of on site. Um, people are, do come to the office some and they want to connect through that way traditionally. But when they're outside or remote workers or whatever, I want them coming through my common shared infrastructure externally. So that'll work. The other thing where you might use this as a use case is let's say you've already got farms already in play in production and you want to migrate towards using the tenant broker. Have them keep connecting to the old way, right, until you get the new infrastructure in place. And then once you've got everybody fully trained and comfortable logging into the old one, then you can shut off the external IP and then start um, turning off the, uh, the, the, the connection layer infrastructure in the tenant. So you can run them both simultaneously. It's possible to connect through a local uh, connection layer infrastructure as well as the tenant broker uh, layer infrastructure simultaneously. That lets you do kind of a, a staged migration, if you will, or staged implementation. Okay. And this is more of an engineering document I pulled out of one of our knowledge base articles. So you can kind of get an idea when we look at this about what components beyond just the traditional um, or the standard gateway load balancer publishing agent VDI RDSH runs, right? So we can see what runs actually where. So if we take a little closer uh, look at this, or at least call some of it out in the way it works, every tenant must have a unique public domain address. That's where I kind of misspoke earlier, right? When I said it, they could use the same URL, they can't. So I could simply say, you know, like tenant1.msp.com tenant2.msp.com and so forth, but it would map to just the single um, IP address that you've exposed publicly. But that different address, and I'll show you how to configure that when we do the demonstration, that different address is what actually directs them to whether they're going to tenant1, tenant2, or whatever. So they use a different URL that will send them to the appropriate uh, farm. If they type in the wrong URL, well, they're still not, you know, you're still not in trouble because they don't have credentials to get into that environment, right? They would, they would have nothing, no active directory or anything to get into that, so they'd be locked out, okay, if they go to the wrong one. The themes, the web themes are defined at the tenant level, okay? So when you do that look and feel, you're actually be logging into the tenant level and going into themes and in, in changing that. That's a little bit separate, right? We've split the tenant themes or the themes off a little bit from the gateway under the cover. So you don't really notice this so much when you're doing the configuration, but remember that the HTML5 gateway and that web interface exists at the tenant broker level here, but the themes are still defined at the tenant level, not at the tenant broker level. Okay. SSL certs, they're going to be defined generally at the tenant broker level. Why do I say generally? Well, it's possible, again, that you could run a gateway infrastructure inside each tenant as well as the tenant broker, which case, if it is public facing, you're going to want to have certs there. But typically, if you don't have gateways inside each tenant, you can manage the certs all just at the tenant uh, broker level, the connection layer level. You don't have to go in there and manage them for each um, individual tenant farm if you, if you don't want to. You don't have to, right? Especially if you don't have gateways, I guess you can't at all. Two-factor two authentication settings are defined at the farm level, right? The tenant farm level, not in the connection uh, layer level, but the tenant broker. So let's think about that, right? The benefits that that gives us. I can now have a single infrastructure where end users come into, but tenant one perhaps uses the Google Authenticator. Tenant two may use Azure MFA. 
right? 10 to three might use duo and so forth, right? I can have a different two-factor authentication um, system for each one of my clients. I could even have 10 at four that has no 2FA. They don't want to pay you for it, so they don't get it. Well, we don't need it, right? They could do something like that. So you define the 2FA settings at the tenant farm level. Okay. Uh, from a licensing standpoint, um, from a big picture standpoint, there's no change to the licensing, right? We don't license per feature. It's just purely concurrent user. So this doesn't cost you anything extra. But the tenant broker uh, has no licensing whatsoever. You can install the tenant broker, and they don't ask you for a license key. So you don't need to plug in a key up to that into that part of it. You can just install it and run with it. The production pieces, right, the actual farm themselves, those do have licenses. That's where you can put your license key or your block key or whatever at that level. But no key needs to go into the tenant uh, broker level. Okay. The tenants can be separate RAS farms, so they could be completely independent and have nothing to do with each other. You also can have them be separate RAS sites if you get into the site infrastructure, if you remember about that, right? So they can be separate sites as well. Uh, let's see what else. Oh, Parallels clients, right? The clients are going to have to be version 17.1 or greater. And uh, that would mean that WISE is not supported through the tenant broker. It's just the type of client can't handle it. So if you use the DHCP configuration settings for WISE, it's not supported through the tenant broker. You can still use WISE, of course. We're not decommissioning WISE many stretch of the imagination. But WISE would have to have um, connect to the farm directly. You'd have to have gateway components inside the RAS tenant farm itself and then have the WISE clients connect to that. Uh, they would not be able to function and work through the tenant broker. It's just it's not capable of the WISE uh, uh, infrastructure where it is now. But the clients in general have to be version 17.1 or later. So if you're running on an older version of the client, uh, they're going to have to upgrade them in order to be able to use the tenant broker piece. And then the last piece uh, to talk about, of course, is the RAS farms. All the tenant farms are going to have to be at version 17.1 or later. Obviously, there's no tenant broker available in an earlier version of RAS, but the tenant farms, you have to get them up to version 17.1 before they can recognize and interact with the tenant broker. Okay, so let's go ahead and do a demo. I'm going to install the tenant broker, and then we're going to connect to a couple of tenants and show you how the whole process works. So to install the tenant broker, I'm just going to run the RAS installer. It's just the regular RAS installer that we download um, and install all the time, right? You just go next. You know, always accept the license agreement. You know, take the defaults here. This is the new option, right? All I have to do is select RAS tenant broker and then kind of let it go. Firewall rules. I don't need to install the single sign-on. That is, again, for the administrator console. It has nothing to do with single sign-on for the end users. I'm not going to bother with it for this. I'll just go ahead and run install. So literally, other than selecting the tenant broker, I just took the defaults. Okay. I sped that up for us a little bit. So I'll then launch the RAS admin console. Okay. Once that's complete, I can just go ahead and log into the tenant broker, right? Similar like we would always do. I can put in local host. I'm creating the first administrator user. I'm going to let it remember my credentials so I don't have to keep typing them in all the time. Notice I'm not specifying a domain here. This is installing on a standalone server. It's not joined to any of the domains that I have. So I'm going to go ahead and click Connect, and we're going to go ahead and log in. And here's the tenant broker. You can see everything looks pretty green, green, and good. I've got a little bit of high CP or RAM usage. But that's all right. It'll settle down. But uh, it's really just a RAS farm, the same tools and format that we all know and love, but it's missing a few things, right? It doesn't have um, it doesn't have the RD session host or VDI or the publishing information or policies or anything like that because it's not doing any of that. It's just providing the shared infrastructure of the gateways and the HALB, if we wanted to add that, and the publishing agent. So just like a regular RAS farm, I could add a second publishing agent, I could configure a HALB, I could do gateways, any of that to create as much redundancy as I want. The one thing that is a little bit different is up here in the tenants, right? I can go, this is where I actually would add the tenants in. Now, before I do this, I want to show you what I've got set up in DNS. So let me minimize this, and I'll open up a command prompt. I've taken down all my Windows firewalls so we can ping and see what's going on. But this particular server is called, um, 
There it is. Uh, cert dash TB. I'm going to ping it using IPv4 so we can kind of see what's going on. So I'll go ahead and just ping itself, and it's replying from a dot forty four address, right? I've also defined two other um, DNS entries in my DNS server. One of which is called cert s one dot local, and when I ping that, notice it's also pinging to dot four four. That's what the tenant one. Um, is going to use when they log in. And then the other one I've done is cleverly named cert-s2.prizelab.local. And that also pings the dot four four. Why does this matter? Well, it I'm pinging really the gateway piece of this. It has nothing else to do with any of the other pieces of the RAS server, but it's the gateway server because I'm running in my lab. But this is what you'd need to do to set up a multi-tenant architecture if you were having real customers in production coming in over the internet except you wouldn't be pinging a, a 10 dot address, right? You would be, um, we wouldn't be pinging anything probably, but you'd be uh, resolving that address to your external address, right? So the tenant one, remember, uh, would resolve to the external address, the external IP. The tenant two URL would also resolve to the external IP. And then of course that external IP would map to a RAS component such as, um, the virtual IP address of the load balancer, or if you're a very small environment, you're just testing it out, perhaps just a single gateway like I'm doing here. But that's really all I'm doing is setting that up because you'll see this cert-s1.prizelab.local and cert.s2.prizelab.local when I configure the tenants. So let me break out of this. I'm gonna go back into my tenant broker console again, and I'm going to uh, go to farm and tenants, and then here's a little blue plus, and I'm gonna add the tenants. So we'll start with um, tenant one, and then from the public I, your domain address, this is that address that um, they're actually going to connect to. So this one would be cert-s1.prizelab.local, uh, okay? And that's it. And then to make the connection, we have an invitation hash, right, that you would use. If I'd gone into administration and configured the mail server, I could have mailed it to myself or to an address where the tenant tenant itself lies, but since I'm just in the lab and can just RDP into different servers, I'm just going to go ahead and copy this, right, and then I'll click OK, and then I will, it tells me that the tenant's not joined, so I can click Apply, but I will then move over to my uh, RAS farm that I'm going to join. So this is a RAS farm that's already up and running, right, and if you look at it, I can go to the site information here so we can look at the dashboard. It's already fully functional. It's got a halb, it's got gateways and all that, but I want to retire this info, this infrastructure here and move people to the tenant infrastructure. So that's easy to do. So I'm controlling this server um, or this farm under farm site, and I just go to tasks and then I click join the tenant broker. I paste that hash in, right? When I do that, Part of the hash also includes the tenant broker address, so it knows where to go to talk to. And I click join, hey, it, applied, it worked, right? I click OK, and then the apply is already done. And now I just have to wait, as you can see, it's synchronizing. And this should come back in just very quick if I just refresh a little bit, and that'll sync up. And if I go back to the uh, tenant broker side, you can see it starts at not verified, and then it'll sync itself up in just a moment. There we go. Now it's okay. I go back over here and I refresh and that's okay too. So now it's working. So I could just connect, open up a web browser, connect to cert-s1.prizelab.local and it would send it right all the way through. But let's go ahead and do another tenant, okay? So I'm gonna go ahead and create another one. And what I'm gonna create is, let's go back to this farm. I actually created two sites in the same farm just to keep it simple. So I could show you this from a single pane of glass. They don't have to be too uh, related to each other at all, remember? They could be two completely separate farms on different Active Directory infrastructure. But just to keep life easy, I'm going to switch and manage the second site. Remember, that's how sites work. I manage one and then the other. Um, and this one's really kind of getting pounded, but that's okay. So how do I differentiate these from a little bit? Well, I changed the theme. The other one is all at the default theme. I left it with the red logo that we all are used to when we first see. Here, I went ahead and switched the colors on the theme to blue. So when you see blue, you notice we're connecting to this one, and when you see red, you're connecting to the other one, okay? So this is the one I'm gonna add and connect to. So let's go back to the tenant broker, and I'm gonna add this one in, so I'm under tenants and farm, 
I'll click the blue plus. This one I will cleverly name tenant two. And the public uh, domain address for this one is cert-s2.praslab.local. And I'll grab this hash here, right? And I'll go back over here and I'm gonna go to tasks and say, join the tenant broker and I'll plug in the hash and I'll go ahead and click okay or join rather. And then what I get back is, uh oh, yeah, I did that on purpose, right? So you get this error here and you're wondering what, what the heck's going on? The tenants is expired or something. That's not what's happening, right? I, if I go back over here, I forgot to click okay. That happened to me once, and so I got that weird error, and I thought I would just kind of show it to you guys as a troubleshooting step. Once you copy this, go ahead and click OK and close it. You might even want to click Apply, right? Then I can go back over here and go to Join. And this time when I plug in that little hash and click Join, it works like a champ, right? So just don't forget to click OK on the other side, All right? And this will take a minute or two to sync up as well. Like I said, there we go, even though I'm having CPU issues on this uh, particular server. Uh, okay, so that's all done and we're ready for the, for the roll. So let's go back over here and I'll just open up a web browser. And I thought I had, um, but I had Chrome installed. All right, we'll just use IE. IE should work just fine. Yeah, I turned off enhanced security, so we're good. So from here, I can literally just type in uh, HTTPS cert s one local, and I don't need that cert tab. And then I'll go ahead and click continue, and here we go. It went ahead and connected right right to the broker. So, and you can tell this is tenant one, it says login tenant one. I did change the theme a little bit and then it's got the red. So then I go to the other one and I'll open up a new tab and type in HTTPS colon forward slash uh, forward slash and I'll call this one cert dash s2 dot lab dot local and enter and then here we go. And this one is blue and it says tenant two. So that's really it, right? Um, that's all you have to do. The main thing is just don't forget to adjust that URL because the URL that your tenants type, your different customers type is what's gonna send them into it. One other little thing I forgot to mention back on my uh, second site, you'll notice this one doesn't have a gateway or load balancer to it, right? So just like I showed you my diagram, I didn't, this is brand new. I configured it specifically for use with the tenant broker. And so I didn't put those in there because I don't need them. The only way to get to this site is to go through the tenant broker itself. And yet the theme settings are right here. And this is where I can adjust the themes. So even though the gateways aren't here, I can still play with them, adjust the themes. Okay. All right. So that's really it for um, the tenant broker demo. Okay, so let's talk about load balancing on Azure and AWS with Parallels Remote Application Server. We all know that Parallels ships with its own load balancer, the HALB, right? The High Availability Virtual Appliance, the uh, HALB, that, that ships with a product. It's great for if you've got an on-premise solution up to about 2,000 users. It's not a good option, though, for cloud-based environments. And the reason for that is simply that adding a virtual appliance to a cloud-based solution adds a lot of cost and complexity from the cloud provider. It's much better to use the native cloud-based load balancing uh, instead if you're running on a cloud platform. And it's really easy to do, you know, from a very high conceptual level, you're simply lifting out our help, our load balancer, and replacing it with the load balancer on the cloud provider, you know, Azure or uh, AWS in this examples, right? So I'm going to demonstrate both how to do Azure and AWS load balancer configuration in just a moment, but I want to spend a little time thinking about gateways in general. It kind of helps us get the big picture of what we're really trying to do. First, let's go back to the basics and think about ports, right? The load balancer, we're going to be um, bringing port 80 or port 443 into the load balancer and out of the load balancer. Most likely, if this is internet facing, it's going to be just 443, right? Port 80 is for unencrypted traffic. And of course, you can change the ports if you want to. You just have to remember to change them on the RAS gateway components and the fact that the clients will, uh, the 
the parallels clients will also be defaulting to 443, so you'd have to specify something else. Okay, so 80 or 443 in and out of the load balancer, usually 443. Also, we have port 80 or 443 going into the gateway component itself, right? So you've got to have the ability to pass traffic in both directions through the load balancer like that. But coming out of the gateway servers, that's where we use the RDP port 3389. That's the only place that we make the connection on that port to a remote desktop server, a virtual desktop, or a remote PC, or whatever is using that. So that's the only time that that port needs to be exposed. You can change it if you want, although I haven't had anybody actually do that yet. But that's the only place buried way, way down in your environment and nowhere near uh, internet facing for that. Okay. Another piece that uh, some people don't necessarily think about is that the gateway virtual machines do not have to be joined to Active Directory. They don't have to be. They can be. It's a heck of a lot easier to manage them when they are, right? Because you don't have to deal with permissions and so forth. But they don't have to be if you're worried about security. They also don't need direct access to the internet, right? Even in our environment, we prefer that, or even in an on-prem environment, we prefer that the direct access to the internet goes to the load balancers, the virtual appliance lockdown system, you know, a smaller attack surface, if you will. Same thing in the cloud environment, right? I'd rather have the load balancer for the cloud actually interface with the internet and then not have uh, the gateway systems do it. Right? You can if you have to in your very small environment, but best practice would be don't, don't do that. The other thing too that I want to kind of revisit that can trip people up sometimes is the gateway redirection features. Right, there's two uh, redirections that we have available within the gateway that can make life easier for the end users. The first one is we'll redirect HTTP to HTTPS, right? Essentially redirecting port AD traffic to port 443 traffic. It's really nice if a user forgets to type in the S and they just type in HTTP, we'll automatically fill it in for them. However, think about that. That redirection is happening at the gateway component, which as I said, is probably not interface, uh, interfacing to the internet and is buried behind the firewall a little bit. So for that to work, an end user would have to get all the way to the gateway over port 80 before we translate that over to port 443, okay? And obviously these are web redirections that I'm talking about, not using the client, but using the HTML5 interface, just to be clear on that one. Uh, I have had some customers that do that. They're pretty security savvy and they kind of know what they're doing. Uh, personally, um, you know, I'll kind of leave that up to you whether you want to do it or not. Uh, but if you do want that redirection to be available, you do have to have port 80 open all the way to the gateway because that's where it happens, at least from within RAS. You may be able to have your own tools that do the redirection yourself, but within Parallels from that application server, that's where it occurs. The second one also is very handy, the second redirect that we use. An end user has the ability to type in just, let's say, HTTPS colon forward slash forward slash, and then the address. Typically on site, it would be the host name or the, the virtual IP address of the load balancer. Just type that in. And then RAS will go ahead and redirect them to the HTML5 web page, right? So we'll go ahead and append a piece that kind of gets them there automatically. It's very handy, particularly for an on-prem environment. It works great off-prem as well, uh, you know, in the cloud or coming in over the internet. But if you're not aware of what's going on and how that mechanism works, this is where it can trip you up. So let's take a little closer look at what's going on there. You can see these settings down within the RAS administrator console under farm and then gateways and then properties of the gateway. And then there's a web tab. It used to say web request. Now it just says the web tab. Okay. In here, we notice that the default address for the HTML5 interface actually is HTTPS colon forward slash forward slash the server name slash RAS HTML5 gateway. You got to have the whole thing in there in order to get to the HTML5 web page. Okay. And the redirect, as I talked about, simply means that you could type in HTTPS colon forward slash forward slash the server name or the address name and it will append the RAS HTML5 gateway to it automatically. So the users can type in kind of the shorter URL and it'll append the longer URL automatically, which gets them to the web page. So kind of nifty, but it can have a problem if you think about coming in over the internet and you leave it at the defaults, right? You've got an external address that you've gotten added, right? To an internal address that ultimately gets to RAS and the gateway servers, right? So. If a user types in that short name, HTTPS colon forward slash forward slash external address and hits enter, they're going to get redirected. It's going to hit the gateway and redirect, 
but look what it's going to redirect them to. HTTPS colon forward slash forward slash server name slash RAS HTML5 gateway, the default. If you look at my server name, my server name is just what I named the Windows server, Praz01. That's the default. Well, guess what? That Praz01 is not valid on the internet, right? The internet and all the servers out there and the names, resolution, and DNS, and blah, blah, and all that has no idea what Praz01 is. So the users will type in the HTTPS colon forward slash forward slash external address, they'll get redirected. And then they're going to get a page not found because what the heck is Praz01? So to get around that, you need to modify the settings under this web uh, tab here. Or you could just type in the whole thing. So either way will work. You could just tell your users, guess what? Type in the whole string, HTTPS colon forward slash forward slash external address slash RAS HTML5 gateway. If you type in the whole thing, it'll work. The other way, and probably really the better way, would be to change the default URL so that it says HTTPS colon forward slash forward slash external address slash slash RAS HTML5 gateway. You can do that right here. Take out the local host name part of the default URL and replace it with your external address. And at that point, it'll work just fine. Okay, so let's go ahead and actually create a load balancer on Azure to use with Parallels Remote Application Server. There are several steps that we're going to follow to do this. It's all documented in a knowledge base article that you see here. It gives you all the steps that you need to do. We're going to start by going into the Azure portal itself and creating an availability set. Then we'll create virtual machines within Azure as part of that availability set. And these are going to be our gateways. So we're going to install the RAS gateway component on them. Okay, then we're going to go ahead and create an Azure load balancer. We'll create a back end pool. We'll create a health probe and then we'll test and evaluate the solution. Okay, so let's go ahead and log into the Azure portal and create an availability set. So I'll get up to my environment up there, click add, and then search in the marketplace. I'll type in availability, yep, and choose availability set right here. And then we'll go ahead and click create. Okay, there it is. It's in the right subscription, the right resource groups, and I'll go ahead and give it a name. We'll call it RAS uh, GW, right, for gateways. And uh, my environment is not in Japan. I'm in the West Coast of the United States. So let's put it in US West 2. And let's see, there we go. US West 2. And uh, the rest of these settings, I think, are fine. So I could just click Review and Create here. If you want to take a look at some of the advanced settings, right, we can go ahead and click on those. I'll just go Next. I'm not going to change anything, but these are the tags and stuff. If you want to take a look at them, we'll go ahead and I guess if just click Create without changing anything. And I'll speed this up so that we don't have to wait for it. OK. There we go, all done, look at that. So let's go to the resource and look, there they are. And now we need to create the virtual machines, right? So we need to create a couple of Windows virtual machines that I can put in the availability set and add the RAS gateway component to. So let's um, go ahead over here to my environment again, and then I'll click on add. And let's see, there's Windows 2016 data center on top. You know what, let's do 2019, let's go crazy, right? Keep current, so we'll go Windows, server, 2019, there it is, and hey, data center. Yeah, you know what? That's good enough for this. We'll just go ahead with data center. Why not? So go ahead and click create. And then it's in, again, the right subscription and resource group, so I can just go ahead and give it a name. This is going to be our first gateway server, so I'll call it RAS uh, GW01. There we go. And again, I'm not in Asia. I'm located in the west coast of the US, so we'll put it up in US West 2. And an availability group, right? That's kind of why we did this. I want an availability set. And let's give it, uh, we already have one. We just created right, RAS GW. Notice though, I actually could have created it right here. So I could have created it on the fly if I wanted to and save me a step. And let's go ahead and change the size. RAS gateways, two processors, four gigs of memory. If the gateway is running all by itself, that's plenty. That support about mm, 750 users, maybe a little bit more. I'm going to go ahead and log in with Victor's credentials. That way he can handle the billing, right? It's all his. Make sure it's in his uh, billing group. You're welcome, Victor. Makes my life easier, right? Why not? And let's see. There we go. Confirm the password. And then uh, I really don't want these guys coming in over 3389. That'd be a big no-no. Let's just keep this internet facing encrypted. So 443 only, right? So I'll get rid of the 3389 there. And then the rest of it's fine. I'll just go next. Uh, that's fine. I'll just leave it at that. And let's see. 
there's my public IP. You know what? I'm going to leave the public IP here. It just makes it a little bit easier for managing. Um, you can go ahead and do this if you'd like this. You probably want to take that away at the end, so don't forget to do that. You don't need a public IP uh, for the gateways. Uh, the load balancer will handle that, right? But I'll just leave it there for now, and I'll just go to next, and review and create. There we go. Okay, so that's the first one going. Let's go ahead and create the second virtual machine. So I'll just do the same process as my deployment is underway. All right. So I'll go up here and click add and then Windows. Let's just be consistent 2019 server. I could mix and match if I want, but why bother with that? So I'll call this one RAS Gateway 02. I'll put it in US West 2. And um, I'll speed this up a little bit so we can kind of get through here since we've already seen what I've done. But essentially the same settings, two processors, four gigs of memory. Oops, I actually think I clicked on eight. It doesn't matter for this. Log in with Victor's credentials again. And there we go, 443, not 3389 for the gateway components on the inbound connections and create. And I've sped it up so this will be done very fast for us. There we go. All right, don't have to wait. Okay, so with that, let's move on and we'll go ahead and install the RAS uh, gateway components next. So let's go over to the RAS administrator console and I'll go to farm and gateways and then I'll click on our little blue plus up in the top right there. And the first server was uh, RAS GW01. Make sure it resolves so DNS is working, right? We're going to enable the HTML5 interface and the firewall rules and I'll click next and install and I'll let this go and I'll speed this up so we don't have to wait for this and it'll be done very fast done and let's go ahead and go through the same process again RAS GW02 and I'll speed this one up since we're just doing the same thing so we can get it done okay so that's just about done uh, there we go done I'll click on done we always click apply all right and then our little uh, RAS monitor is telling me that yeah the services aren't online yet I'll click refresh a couple of times and there we go green green all good okay and then with that we can move back over to the Azure portal let me get back into uh, my environment that's up there right and there we go and then let's go ahead and add a load balancer so I'll click add start typing load balancer in the marketplace there it is and there's a load balancer click create all right and uh, yep, all that's good. Let's go ahead and give it a name. So we'll call it RAS-LB. There we go. And it's, of course, in US West 2. So let me get up to that. US West uh, 2. There we go. Okay. Public is where it's facing. The rest of the SKUs are good there. And we definitely want to create, let's go ahead and create a new public uh, IP address name. So we're going to create a public IP address and we'll create a public IP address name. So I'll just call this RAS dash, uh, dash, I don't know, IP, right? How boring. There we go. Okay, so that's done. Uh, we don't want it to be dynamic. I want it to be static. People are really connecting to this. I don't want it changing all the time. Okay, so static it is. That's the best practice. And then from here, we can go ahead. We're done. So let's go ahead and click review and create. Okay, so that'll create for us. I'll speed it up so it creates fairly quickly. We passed the validation test and now we're actually creating it. Okay, there we go, underway, and now it's just about done. Okay, so let's take a look at it. We'll go to the resource itself. And from here, now we can create the other things that we need to do. So let's start with the backend pools. So from within the load balancer, I can click on uh, backend pools right there. Okay. And then I'll click add. We're going to add a pool. So there's the add button. And then let's call it, uh, we need to give it a name. So let's just call it, um, let's see, RAS-LB, LB-pool. Okay, that's there. And then the virtual network, these are our gateway systems, right? They don't need to be public facing. That's what the load balancer is for. So I'm just going to put it on the lab net. Right. And then what are we going to associate this back end pool to? Well, we need to point it to our two gateway systems. So I'm just going to go ahead and choose under associated to a uh, virtual machine. Right. Actually, virtual machines. I'll add both of them here. So virtual machine is RAS uh, Gateway 01. And then I'll add the other one too, which is RAS Gateway 02. 
and I don't want to forget to do the IP address either, right? <laughs> so I'll choose that one. And uh, 10 dot, notice it's on a 10 dot. It is internal. It does not need to be public facing. So there they are. I actually could have gone and done a uh, virtual machine scale set if I'd set that up. But with just two virtual machines in this little environment doing a um, just brute force and add the two virtual machines manually here is perfect. So I'll go ahead and do that. Click add and that's rolling along. Okay, I'll speed this up for us and they're done. So there's the back end pool and you can see it has both our virtual machines in it, RAS Gateway 01 and 02. So now I'll click on health probes from within the load balancer and we're gonna add a health probe. So I'll go up there and click on add and let's give it a name and this will be RAS LB dash um, oh, probe, okay? Or no, actually, you know what? Let's use uh, TCP443. That way it'll probe over the ports uh, that I want to do, because that's what actually we're going to be testing is that. So the protocol is TCP and the probe is 443, right? The health probe, what I want to do is make sure that it's going to check that our, both our gateways are up. If one of them's not answering on 443 or one of them's down, there's no point in load balancing people to that. So we'll go ahead and create that. That'll make sure that they're up and hit actually functions and sends people to a port that are a gateway that's up. Okay, so let's actually do the load balancing rules. So I clicked on load balancing and I'm adding the rule here. And RAS LB, uh, I'm going to do the same thing, TCP443, because that's what we're actually load balancing is that port. IPv4 is fine. There's our public IP address from Azure. And the protocol is TCP. And then the port, uh, we're going to switch that to 443. So incoming connections, 443. Back end, it's going to come out to 443. All right, we're coming in and out over 443. The gateways will handle it from there. Back end pool is set. The health probe is set. And let's change the session persistence to client IP and protocol. OK, so that's good. I don't really need to change these other things. So I can go ahead and click on OK. And that will handle that. All right. Okay, so that's created and done. Sped that up for us. There we go. There's our rules. I'm going back in here because I want to get the public IP address. Okay, because now we're going to test it out. So I'll go ahead and um, copy that. And let's move over to our load balancer. Now I haven't set up the web redirection yet within Parallels RAS, so I'm going to have to use the full name here, HTTPS colon slash slash, and then that public IP address I put in, and then the RAS HTML5 gateway uh, tag. Let me get through the um, self-signed certificate. There we go. Hey, it's working. Look at that. All right. So the load balancer is working, RAS is working. Let's just go ahead and clean up that web redirection. So back to the RAS console under farm and gateways, I get either uh, select a gateway, right click properties, double click, or I can go over here to tasks and then properties. Okay, and then I'll go to the web tab. And site defaults, great new feature. I can change it for all the gateways at once. I'll replace the host name part of that tag with the public IP address, click okay. We always click apply. That's done, right? That's it, that quick. So let's go back to our web browser. Now what I can do is strip out that RAS HTML5 gateway tag. I don't have to add it when I type it in. I can just do the HTTPS public IP address, and there it works. Voila, success. So we have successfully created an Azure load balancer and integrated it with Parallels Remote Application Server. That's it. So let's switch gears and look at Amazon Web Services and what it takes to get a load balancer running on AWS with RAS. All the steps that we're going to be going through are documented in a knowledge base article that I have listed here. But essentially, we're just going to log into the EC2 dashboard, choose the load balancer type, configure it, then we'll configure the routing and register the targets, the targets being the RAS gateways, review and create the load balancer, finalize the configuration, and then, of course, test and evaluate. Okay, so let's go ahead and log into the EC2 dashboard and we'll start configuring. So first off, we do have two running instances up here already, and they both have the um, Parallels RAS gateway component already installed on them. So those are the two pieces that we're actually going to be load balancing. Okay, so let's go back to the dashboard and we'll actually go ahead and create a load balancer. Okay, so we'll go down to load balancers and then we'll go click create load balancer and the type we're going to pick is a network load balancer because that's what we're doing we're just load balancing 443 connections so let's call it RAS certification 
And then for, uh, it has to be internet facing, right? Public use. And then TCP, UDP, that would be the preferred method. So we can use both protocols. It could also work with TCP, but TCP, UDP is better. And then don't forget to change that port, right? 443, so make sure that's the port. And let's put it in the uh, zone that we want. And we're in US East 1B is where the rest of this is. So that's it. So let's go ahead and click next and we'll configure the routing. All right, so the target name, we'll just call it uh, RAS Gateway GW TCP UDP. Again, make sure that port is 443. And uh, that's good. It's just TCP for the health checks. We just want to make sure that TCP is running, right? Make sure it's up and we'll just leave that alone. The rest of them are fine. And then we're going to add our instances to it and register the targets, right? So add to the register. Again, those are the two gateways that we've already configured. We'll go on next and we'll review and then we'll go ahead and create. Okay, so that's it. It was really fast. And then all we need to do is just watch the state up here that's provisioning and it'll switch to active very soon. There we go. It's active. Uh, we usually give it a couple of minutes to kind of settle. If you go into it too fast, it's not going to work. Uh, but Give it a minute, but in the meantime, let's go ahead and change the load balancer attribute deregistration delay to zero seconds. So we'll go in here to edit attributes and then just change this delay to zero. That's in the knowledge base article, by the way. So we'll save that. And with that, there it is. It's all good. It's active and it's ready to use. So let me go ahead and grab the public DNS name right here. And then I'll go ahead and copy and paste this into a web browser. But remember, we haven't done the web redirection yet. So I'm going to add the RAS HTML5 gateway tag. There we go. And then when I hit enter, we'll probably hit the self-signed certificate. And there it is. That means that we're actually hitting the RAS server, the gateway server. So good. We'll just plow right through this. And we will see, in fact, that it is up. There we go. Success. Okay. So let's go ahead and adjust the web redirection, right, like we did before. So we'll go to farm gateways, and then we'll go to the properties of the gateway here and web request and then i'll change it for everything under site defaults and then we'll take out that local server address and we'll add in the public address and with the tag afterwards and then once that's done we can go ahead and click um there we go let me finish typing in the https don't want to forget that part either <clears throat> okay so now we're good we'll click okay Okay, and we can go ahead and click apply, and let's try it out. So now I should just be able to type in the public address without the tag, right? And when I hit enter, we should all be good. So, whoops, <laughs> look at that. I made a typo in the web redirection settings, HTML gateway, not HTML5 gateway. So let's go back and we'll fix that. I'll go back into the properties of the gateways web. There it is under site defaults. Let me just add that little five in there. It has to have the full RAS HTML5 gateway to work, as you see. So, okay, and apply. Now we can go back, and this time I'll just type in HTTPS in the public address without that tag. And there we go. Voila, it works. So that's how you configure an Amazon Web Services load balancer to work with parallels. And with that, I think we've earned a break. So I'm going to set the timer for 20 minutes, and let's do a break. See you in 20 minutes, folks.
Welcome back, everybody. Hope you all had a nice break. Okay, let's move on and we're going to talk about SAML. This is kind of a big topic, actually. It's uh, one of the bigger features that we have in uh, version 17.1. It's one of those that I definitely pre recorded and I'm just going to live narrate over because there's a lot of steps to get through. I always like to start with the diagram so we can kind of get a big picture overview of what's happening. So, from a high level, you as service providers want to get out of the business of managing end user accounts, right? Users coming and going at your various customers, changing passwords, et cetera, things like that. You'd like to be out of that business. And the customers themselves, they would like to be able to use their own accounts, right? Maybe their own email address and their own password to log in and not have to keep track of a second one to get to the services that you're providing. And that's where SAML comes in. SAML is kind of that uh, full-on integration. It starts with a third-party kind of identity provider provided by Azure, Okta, or SafeNet. It ties in the customer's directory and authentication services to that, the identity providers, and it also provides your configuration in your Active Directory to the, uh, to the identity provider. So it's all neatly tied in together. So why do you still have to have your own Active Directory if SAML and the uh, customer is handling it as well? Well, think what they're logging into. It's a remote desktop server or terminal server if you prefer. It's a Windows server. It requires Active Directory for authentication. You also have to have a user for everybody logging in. There's just no way around that. That's how Active Directory works. But the customers don't need to know about that exact user account, right? We're going to do some mapping between that. So there's the passwords and everything is managed on the customer side. And we do that through an entity that we have in RAS called the Enrollment Server, which ties into SAML. If we take a little closer look at the Enrollment Server, like I said, it's just a separate component within RAS. It deploys from the RAS console like other RAS components, right? Go into enrollment servers under farm and click the little blue plus and push it out. It's a little bit different in that it must run on its own server with no other RAS components. Okay, it won't even let you install it uh, on a PA or a gateway or anything like that, like the other RAS components will let you double up. This one won't even let you do that. Also, think about what it's doing, right? It should be a secure, dedicated server similar to a domain controller or certificate authority. And um, a couple other nice things about it is you can use multiple enrollment servers for high availability, right? So you can just deploy another one, another one. They'll run active actives. They're all doing work for you. In case one fails, the others will take over. Uh, they do have to share the same registration key, and there's a few other little quirks and things about them, but it's all in the documentation, and you'll see where all that is when we go through and do the demonstration. So let's move on and we'll go ahead and take a look at the prerequisites before we kind of get into the actual demonstration and setting all this up. Uh, the Parallels Remote Application Server Admin Guide has all of this information. I pulled a lot of it out of that. There's also a knowledge base article, but I actually like the admin guide a little bit better. It's got a little bit more detail, um, presents a little bit better, and so forth. But from a prerequisite standpoint, let's first look at your Microsoft Active Directory. This is your Active Directory where the RAS components are installed. As I mentioned, we do have to install or create rather two users, an enrollment agent user and an NLE user. The enrollment agent user is used to enroll certificates to the RAS enrollment server on behalf of the user. And then the NLA user actually will be used to initiate the connection uh, to the RDSH instance or VDI desktop, whatever you're doing. Uh, that NLA user is a little interesting, right? It, it kind of has to have two almost um, uh, diametrically opposing roles. It, it, it needs to be a member of the remote desktop users group so that it can log in on behalf of the user. Uh, it uses a virtual smart card to do that. But we also don't want people to hijack this and then kind of use that by itself. And so we also would like to set up a policy that would deny login through remote desktop services. And we'll do both of this in the demo, both of these in the demonstration. You're going to have to have a Microsoft Enterprise Certification Authority running with certain templates, enrollment agent certificate template, and the smart card logon certificate template. And uh, obviously, you'll have to have a third party identity provider. We're not going to spend too much time with this, so I'm going to go ahead and leisure, or leverage the Azure AD when we do the demo. And then your domain controllers, eh, they're going to have to have some domain controller certificates that they're going to have to support smart card authentication. What's the deal with the smart cards? Why do I keep bringing that up? Well, that's kind of the magic that we're doing under the covers, right? We're injecting a virtual smart card into Active Directory on behalf of the user. And that's what actually allows the, the login process to happen is by using virtual smart cards. 
All right, so let's go ahead and configure the whole thing soup to nuts. I've already got a RAS farm configured using what I'm going to call my local AD. And then we've got, um, I'm going to use Azure AD as the identity provider. So the first thing is to remember to create those two service accounts for RAS inside my local AD, if you will. That's what my RAS farm is joined to. So I'll go ahead and create a new user. And this will be the enrollment agent user. All right, so we'll just call this um, SSO. Let's see. My mouse fixed here. SSO. About maybe I'll do like uh, SSO agent. That's it. So that'll be the enrollment uh, agent user. I'm calling it SSO agent. We go ahead and give them a password. And I'll go ahead and uh, confirm that password. And then uh, this is an account I really don't want that password expiring on me. So I'll do that. All right, that one's done. So let's go ahead and create the other one. And I'll do the uh, the NLA user here. All right, so go ahead and just create the new user there. And NLA, and, you know, just be consistent. I'll call this one, I guess, NLA agent. I'll go ahead and do the same thing by setting the passwords for them here. Let's hope I don't fat finger the uh, confirm password. Hopefully that'll work. And this is another one too. I really don't want the password expiring or changing on me. It'll take things down. Next day, look at that. Good finish. No fat fingering. Okay, so remember that SSO agent. That's the enrollment agent user. It's the account used to enroll certificates to the RAS uh, enrollment server on behalf of the authenticated user. So what I need to do is go ahead and um, delegate control for that. So I'll just right click on the user's container and delegate control just to the whole container, just to my little uh, farm here. I could do this at the organizational unit level if I wanted to keep everybody in the OU, but my little lab, I'll just do it right here, uh, just in the whole container. All right. So for the name in here, it was SSO agent. Okay. That's in because that's what I named the enrollment agent. And then I need to, uh, let me see, like the following objects. So I want to manage just the user objects, right? So that's kind of what I'm going through here. This is all in the documentation. Like I said, if you follow through, actually the knowledge base for this. But I'm going to go down and do just the user objects because that's all I really want this being able to manage on. And then um, uh, let's see, I'll check uh, oh, property, uh, property specific here. I can talk. And then this is the fun part. Um, this is a huge list and I need to find two specific properties um, that I'm kind of getting down to. It's that read, write, all security entities. All right, so let's see, I know they're here somewhere. Like I said, it's a massive list. I wish they had like a search or something, right? There we go, read, all security identities. I'll do read, write, and then finish. Okay. So that part's done uh, for that user. And then what I'm gonna do next, let's see, All right, just kind of going through the notes here, is, um, oh yeah, the NL agent user, right? Remember this one has to have those kind of two diametrically opposing roles. So the first thing I'm gonna do is make it a member of the remote desktop users group of my domain. Um, there we go. That way it can, uh, like I said, log in on behalf of my users. It won't actually log in. It's going to do it on behalf of them. It'll inject the smart card that that's done. And then because I don't want people um, or somebody to actually be able to log in with this user, I don't want it actually logging in interactively. I'm going to go into group policy here and set group policy to um, to deny logon through remote desktop services. So go ahead and create a GPO. I'll call that one RAS SAML. And then I'll go ahead and link it here and then um, edit. And let's see. So I'm just looking to see where this one is. Policies. And then it's under, I think it's under Windows settings. Yep. Pull this out a little bit so I can see the security settings, local policies, user right assignments. And then here somewhere I'll see deny access. Deny log on through, there it is. Um, and I log on through remote desktop services. So yes, I want to define this. Um, it's kind of a backwards one. Yeah, deny all login. Yes, and here's my user, my NLE user. So that's done. 
All right, so now they've got kind of both roles that are set in place. Okay, so now I'm going to configure the uh, certificate authority templates. So to do that, you go ahead and launch uh, the MMC, Microsoft Management Console here. All right, and then we'll um, add remove a snap in. And then what I want to add is the certificate templates. So that's what I'm going to be managing. Okay, so it's good. Let's go into certificate templates. And then I'm going to create the enrollment agent template. So I'll click on enrollment, uh, the enrollment agent there. I want to duplicate this template, actually. That's the way you change it. So I've duplicated it, and then we'll give it um, a new name and everything. So, all right. So we'll go over to the general tab, and it's a copy of an enrollment agent. Let me change that name, and it needs to be a PRLS enrollment agent. And that'll also fix the template name as well. There we go, enrollment agent. Validity period is two weeks, renewal is six weeks. Publish it in Active Directory, but don't check that box that says do not automatically enroll. Okay, that looks good. And then the next tab I'm going over is, let me go to the uh, cryptography tab. Yeah, okay. So go to the cryptography tab tab and then uh, requests you must use one of the following uh, providers it's determined by yeah that rule so i'm going to uncheck that one and that one and then go down to the microsoft strong cryptographic provider and i want to move this all the way to the top yeah so just check that one and make sure it's on the top <clears throat> okay let's look at my notes here i said there's a lot of steps to saml right and then I'm going to go to the security tab. And then here I'm going to add the enrollment agent user. Remember, we called that one SSO agent. So I'll check the names, click OK. And this guy has to have a read and enroll uh, permissions here. So I need to allow those two. Right. Yeah, that's it. So I'll go ahead and click OK. There we go. That one's done. And now I need to create the smart card logon certificate template. So back to my list here, and there's smart card logon. Right click, I need to duplicate the template. And then let's go to the general tab. And instead of copy of smart card logon, let's change that to parallels, PRLS, um, smart card. And then uh, delivery period, smart card um, logon. There we go. And then the validity period, one year, six weeks for the renewal, that's good. And um, that's it. Okay, so we can move over to the cryptography and then frequent um, must use one of these, a request must use one of these following providers. And again, um, the one I want to use here is the Microsoft Strong Cryptographic Provider, just like before. And I'll move this all the way up to the top again, just like we did. And in the security tab, I need to add the uh, SSO agent, the enrollment user. So do that right there. And that one also needs, this time it needs, uh, yeah, read and enroll. And then I'll look back at the issuance requirements. Uh, the number of authorized signatures is one application policy, and then for any purpose, uh, user certificate request agent. That's what I'd like for that one. Okay. And those settings are good, so I can go ahead and click apply and okay. All right, so now let's go ahead and issue the certificate templates. I could have done it one at a time, but I'm gonna do them both. So back into MMC, and then I'll add and remove a snap in. And this time I'm going to actually add the certificate authority. So put that on here. And now I've got this tool going. And then I go into the, come on, let everything catch up a minute. I'll go into this and then um, drill down to the certificate templates. And then I'm going to uh, create a new certificate template to the issue. 
and I should be able to pick my two. So I'll start with the PRLS enrollment agent and click OK. That's in there. And then let's go ahead and um, let's do the other one. So right click in new certificate templates to issue. And I'll go down and get the other one, right? The uh, URLS smart card log on. So there they are. They're both there. So that's been done. I've issued both of them. I can go ahead and close and get out of this. Okay, so now I want to restart the Active Directory Certificate Services. So I'll go into Manage and Services from the Server Manager here. And then, uh, let's see, I guess it's what? Oh, Active Directory. So it's probably near the top, right? There we go. Let me expand that out just to make sure I'm getting the right one. Yep, Active Directory Certificate Services. And I'll go ahead and restart that. Okay, so it's time actually to go over to the RAS console and we'll set up an enrollment server. I actually have a server all ready to go, as you can see, so I don't have to deploy Windows or anything for it. So just farm enrollment servers, click on the little blue plus, just like we do so many things. Um, exactly like that, I'll type in the name of the server as ESO1. Yeah, I'll go ahead and go next. It's gonna look for an agent, tell me it's not there. That's the timeout, right? Of course, it's not there, I haven't deployed it yet. So there it is. So since it's not there, I'll go ahead and install it and it'll take a few minutes. Um, I'm actually going to speed this up real quick. So it's just going to zoom right on by for us so we don't have to wait. Okay, there we go. We'll get that done. Okay, so I'll go ahead and click on done. The agent says it's there. I'll go ahead and click on OK. And then um, we always click apply. Now, this would come back and tell me it's not validated yet because I haven't done the AD integration. So let's go ahead and do that. I'll go to the AD tab, to certificate authority. This information is already in here for us. And then I want to add the enrollment agent, right? That's our SSO agent, right? The enrollment agent user. So I'll go ahead and uh, put that one in. And then the NLA user, well, hey, that's the NLA agent user we, we just created, right? Go figure. So let me look that one off, NLA agent. and. Oh, having to browse through the domain. There we go. Okay, NLA agent user, and then I'll go ahead and put the uh, password in for that one. And if I click on validate, I get this error message. It's just a normal informational message. It takes a minute. I got to click apply first, of course, right? And then it takes a minute for this to sync up. So there's that invalid I was talking about. I just refresh it and it should come back and it's okay. And now if I go back into the AD integration, and click on uh, validate, right? We're all good, perfect. Okay, so uh, now let's go back to Active Directory. This is again my local AD, if you will, not the Azure AD. And I'm gonna go to that um, GPO that I created earlier, RAS SAML that would deny log on to the NLA agent user. And what I wanna do is, I'm just gonna go ahead and add the, um, select computers here, make sure it's looking at the right object. I'm going to add my remote application server. I just have one in my farm for a demo here. I'm going to add that to this. I could actually do this all through an organizational unit and link it that way, but uh, for here, I'm just going to do this and then I'm going to make sure that's enforced so that that's taking effect. Okay, so let's go back to the RAS console. I'm going to configure the integration with our identity provider, which is Azure. So connections, SAML, click a little blue plus. Um, we'll go ahead and give it a name. I'll just call it RAS SAML. Remember, SAML uses HTML5 only, so I can pick a theme that I want this to apply to. I'll just use the default theme, so that's all I have in the lab, but I could pick any theme that I created. And now I need to... Um, to copy the address over here. So let me go back over to Azure AD and actually we need to create SAML. So I'll go into Active Directory on Azure. This is the Azure side, of course. And I'm gonna create a new enterprise application. We've got a bunch of them running already in our environment, but I'm gonna create a new application and it's a non-gallery app. And the name I'll give it, um, let's see, how about just RAS, Lab certification. There we go. I'll go ahead and add. I'll pop up in just a second. There we go. And then I'm going to assign the users and groups. That's done. And I'm going to set up single sign on. So let's do the single sign on. And we're choosing SAML here, of course. 
and then let's just kind of work our way through. So um, right here, you'll see the, uh, the Federation URL. Let's go ahead and copy that. Usually we can just copy and paste this in and I'll go back to that screen that I left up inside um, RAS and do that. Paste it, click next, and yeah, that didn't work. Okay, sometimes that happens. I think we're still kind of figuring that out. It's not a big deal if it does. Um, it'll time out here. What I'll need to do though is go back over to Azure and download the uh, federated uh, metadata XML. So let me download that and then I can just import it in. And this will work. I'm not sure what's going on with that copy paste. Like I said, I think that's still something that's being massaged a little bit. So let me choose here the upload from the file and then let me browse over and find where I downloaded that file. Right, bouncing back and forth between RDP windows and virtual windows and all that. It's always fun. <clears throat> okay, there it is. That's where you put it. So you put that in there, click open, and then I'll click next and see uh, that work. So here we are. And I've got my log on and log out URLs um, right there. So I'll click finish and then click apply. Okay, and I'll go into the properties and then let's click on that SP. This is the Azure uh, load balancer address that I'm going to put in here. The reason it's the Azure load balancer address is that's the one that was already configured. So we'll just use that because that's what people are doing. So let me go ahead and put that IP in there. And then it fills out a string of URLs for me. I'm going to need each of those and I can copy them each in turn. So I'll copy the first one. And then I'll go into the re uh, RAS, the SAML configuration here, and I'll paste the identity provider, uh, identity entity ID in here that I got from the console in RAS. That's there. Okay. And then I'll go back over to my uh, environment in RAS, and I'll get the apply URL, and I'll go ahead and paste that there. Right. And the next would be the logon URL, which I'll get, and I'll paste it here. The relay state URL, by the way, actually isn't necessary, but we usually just paste the, uh, the sign on in there as, as well. So you can just do that twice if you'd like. And then for the logout URL, I will put that in the logout URL. Imagine that, right? I love it when things match up. Okay, so that part's done. And I'll click save. And then while that's going on, we'll see that now the URLs match the RAS settings. Okay, so next I wanna go into the user attributes and claims and pick a claim name. I mean, you could select for the type of login you want. I think most people would just prefer to use the email address. So that's what we'll do. If you look at the knowledge base article that we have here, actually what I wanna copy is the user principal name, not the user mail name. I'm not sure why, but the developers do and it's in the, URL, and it's in the KB article. So I'll go back over here the RAS console will go to attributes and custom and then for mail I'll take out that little email and the custom attribute and I'm going to plug in that user principal name and then uh, go ahead and click OK and then we always click apply right. Okay within that let's go back to my local active directory the non Azure active directory and I need to create some users. Remember, it's a remote desktop server. It's joined to the domain. Every user, even if it's coming from a foreign directory, I guess, like this is, it has to be unique uh, for this to really work all the way through. Right? If I just had a single dummy user that was logging in all over the place, then every single user would be logging into the remote desktop server with the same user. And that would be a mess, right? Get the same profile and everything. One user to one account, even though I'm passing it through. So I'll just create a test user. I don't have to worry about the password here so much. I can create just a random password that never expires because remember, we're actually going to be injecting a smart card, a virtual smart card here for the login. So that'll be my test user. I have to do this for every user that I have. And then the way I associate it though, is I go into the attributes and add the email. And I'm going to add my Azure AD email here, right? Not anything to do with this domain at all, but my Azure AD email in there. That'll create the hook that ties this in together. Okay, one last little thing to clean up here. Those of you that were eagle-eyed might have noticed that I skipped the very first step when I set up the uh, SAML on Azure, and that was the head group and add the assignment. 
Uh, what I need to do here actually is take my Azure AD users, and I'm going to use admin uh, for one, and then I'll grab my uh, BDI desktop, even though this is remote desktop, the users are in that group. And what I'm doing is I'm granting these Azure user accounts permission to use the SAML app. So don't forget that step, right? So I'm doing that here and I'm clicking to sign and you can see that now I've added both those to the group or both those groups to the permissions. And if I look in this one group and look at the members, you'll see the email address I used matches this one. So it is a member of the group. So it works all the way through and it does the handoff and everything else. And it should work, right? So let's find out, moment of truth. So I'm gonna go ahead and I'll reinitiate the login to the web page here. And notice it gives me a, not a RAS logon, but ultimately I'm gonna get the SAML logon, right? That we've been seeing. So that should be kind of familiar to the users in that regard. Go back to that, log in. And again, this is the password for that Azure AD email account. Nothing to do with anything we've created in your local, quote, local AD or in uh, RAS. So I'll go ahead and sign in and there's my app. I, I've just published a, a desktop off the terminal servers, all we did. I could use the Parallels client integrated here, but I'm actually gonna, let's just launch this in HTML5 only. That's always kind of cool. I always kind of like this interface. And when you go full screen, you really can't even tell that you're running in a tab in the browser, right? I see the Parallels logo and that tells me success. So, hey, we did it, Woohoo! All right, and yeah, you can see I can move around and use this just like a regular desktop, right? We're successful, we've logged in, like I said, woohoo. So let's break out of this and we'll look back at the RAS console and I wanna show you who actually logged in, farm, already session post. And then we'll go to sessions and look at that. You can see that it actually is a test user, it has nothing to do with that. So you might actually wanna name this something that's a little bit more useful than test user. I did it just so we can see. So very easy, very easy to set up, huh? Super simple, not complex at all. <laughs> if only. Uh, it's just the nature of SAML. So to be honest, the first time we recorded this, we got an error and I had to go back to the magic of video and connect but, or fix it. But this is what we got. We logged in. I want to show you kind of what happened so you can get an idea about how to uh, things didn't go wrong here. Um, so let's go back in time. So we logged in, we did this, and then we kind of went through the single sign-on piece. We got this far to the desktop. And then when we launched the desktop, right, to HTML5, uh, Denied. Why is this denied? And you got to think, okay, is it certificates? Is it something I did in group policy? No, this was super simple. We forgot to add that um, NLA agent user to the remote desktop users group. Don't forget the basics. You just It's the basics right there. That was what happened. So now if I go back and do it, I don't have to log out and back on. This is taking part inside uh, the local active directory. Okay. So very easy to kind of miss a step. It's just the nature of SAML. We've got it all documented very closely. There's knowledge base articles for both Okta and Azure that take you pretty far into those identity providers, how to do this. Um, so those are there. And we've also got some other knowledge base articles as well. Other identity providers will work. So it's not just limited to those two. Those are just the two that we have documentation on currently. So a couple of quick tips I've seen um, with SAML is don't forget that it's, it requires HTML5 as your authentication, right? I can't use the client uh, directly. I have to use the HTML5 interface for the login because SAML is a web-based application. Now I can use the client and take full advantage of that, but I just have to use the HTML5 integrated client. We saw that earlier. Remember, we uh, when I logged in, we did the right click and there was the option to use the client or the HTML5 only, but the interface that the user is presented with is, um, is the HTML5 interface and it's tied to themes. So you actually could have a SAML theme and a non-SAML theme if you wanted to. And the client does have to be version 17.1 or later. The other one I see, which is very related to this, is sometimes people will see that Parallels client-based SSO that has nothing to do with SAML, right? They see kind of this interface, single sign-on, SAML talks about single sign-on, same thing. Well, first of all, you shouldn't be using the client. Remember, SAML is uh, HTML5 only. It's a web application. But this is just the client piece. If you install single sign-on using the Parallels client directly, it's it just uses the local Active Directory, whatever the client is joined to, 
It will pass those credentials into RAS. That's what that is for. It has nothing whatsoever to do with SAML. So just don't get confused there. Okay, and then the last little tidbit is, you notice we're doing this with RDSH. That's what's currently supported. According to the documentation, BDI with SAML and RAS is limited. I'm not sure exactly uh, what limited is by, uh, but it's what's in the documentation. I do know that we will be adding in BDI support in the not too distant future. But other than that, um, that's it for SAML. Okay, so let's take a look at some of the logs and uh, some of the troubleshooting techniques that we go through, as well as some of the tools that are available to us as well within RAS. Um, so I want to start with kind of an introduction to the logging system within RAS, and then I'm going to show you some examples of how we use the logs to uh, troubleshoot and resolve some issues. I want to talk about resolving some compatibility issues, uh, specifically using a tool called a Remote App, which actually is from Microsoft. That's a shell. I'll talk about shells in a minute. And then we'll look at the auditing and revert settings, uh, a little bit of information and in server tools on those categories and how that works. And we'll also do a little demo of some of this as well. But to start, let's just take a look at logging, right? I think most of you guys are probably all familiar with this, but you can look at the logging settings under farm and then go down to the settings. Um, item under there and then go to global logging. From here, it lists kind of the standard logs that are available. And you can select a single log or multiple logs, and then we perform an action on top of it. So select the logs you want, like here I'm going to grab my two PAs, and I'll click configure logging on them. And I can choose the level of logging that I want. Now standard is on by default, but you can add extended and verbose logging. Some of the logs I'm going to show you, I'm going to list kind of what all the logs are. You can see what they kind of tie to are only going to exist if you've got extended logging on. That's just the only way to work. Uh, verbose logging, that gets pretty uh, aggressive. At that point, you're probably looking at like engineering type data that would be more useful for the uh, development team than anything. Uh, extended and verbose in particular have a, a performance impact on your servers, right? They're aggressively logging. It's just going to it's going to take up some cycles. That's just the name of logging. One of the cool things, though, is you actually can set a time to how long you can run that um, verbose or extended logging on. Standard logging is just on by default. It's on 24 7, 365. But extended or verbose, you can say, okay, it's been happening sometime within this certain time period. Let's turn that on. That also can be useful because you can see the clear button up there, right? Uh, clearing the logs, you can start fresh. These logs get kind of long and trying to dig through and read all this very uh, dry data uh, can be a little tedious and difficult to figure out. So if you're kind of in a troubleshooting situation that you at least know somewhat duplicatable, um, or at least you know it'll happen before too long, you probably could back up your logs, clear them, and then turn on extended or verse both logging for a period of time, let it happen again, and then you can go ahead and retrieve them. Uh, you can retrieve them here. It kind of puts it up in a nice neat zip file for you and lets you save them where you want. Uh, but that's kind of the high level there. Uh, if we look at the log specifically, the main one really is the controller log that's associated with the publishing agent. You can see the publishing agent, just in case anybody doesn't remember, is really the central piece. It's the controller, uh, the connection broker, if you will. It handles a lot of the a lot of the main uh, activity that goes on authenticates with Active Directory, second level authentication is there, a lot of notification of devices and updates. Um, distribute the settings and information out to the remote agents, management of the RDP session information, the app information, uh, orchestrate a lot of these different uh, pieces and parts. It's kind of the core piece. So it's usually a good place to start when you're looking at the logs. Again, these are the logs that are generally or that are associated with the publishing agent. You might, again, not see all of these on your system if you're kind of following along, unless you turn on extended logging. But the controller log is really the first place I usually go, unless it's obvious that maybe I should go somewhere else. But um, the controller log really is going to have a lot of that information in it uh, that you want for troubleshooting. The installer logs, uh, there's really two types. There's the uh, installation and then the setup logs. 
Installation, uh, you know, this is really, did it run, right? Th these are used also, by the way, when we're pushing agents to other servers. We usually would push the RAS installer. It's going to run it locally over there. That information can be captured in the installation log files, but mostly it's going to tell us, did the, uh, did the installer run, did it finish, did it complete, as opposed to did it crash partway through. If you want to get down into the details of what happened, that's when you start looking at the setup log, right? That can be useful if you actually run through the setup itself, but also the, again, when you're pushing an agent out, it will run through an actual setup process kind of silently, so we don't have to see it, right? We just see the little status bar in the RAS console, but that information is being captured in the setup logs. For the RDSH agent logs, there's a lot of them here. Oh, and by the way, um, all these logs are stored in the program data directory under parallels and then RAS logs. So if you don't um, necessarily just retrieve all logs, if you just like to run to them directly very quick, usually that program data is at the root of the C drive, right? So backslash program data, but I guess it's a system variable, so it could be anywhere. Program data is usually a hidden folder, by the way. So you have to turn on hidden files and folders to see that. Um, these are the ones that are associated with the terminal server agent. Again, TS agent is always there. Some of the others may or may not be. I'm not going to read through all the logs. You're going to have access to these um, slides. I just wanted to list them here so you would be able to see them. I don't think this information is in the admin guide. Next up would be the server logs, uh, you know, for the gateway, VDI agent, the enrollment agent, right? We have a new enrollment agent server or enrollment server, rather. These are the ones that are typically or that are associated with these. And then don't forget, too, that there's client side logging as well. Uh, the easiest way to get that from a Windows client is you just go to the Parallels client directly and turn on tools and options. And then you can view log, right? You also can enable extended logging in the client as well, um, which will do uh, the extended logging piece, right? You'll get more information there. So don't forget there's client logs. They also have logging on other devices as well. This is where you would go find it on the Mac client, right? You go into the Parallels client, preferences, general tab, and then logging. You can view log, clear log, enable extended logging, and so forth. Um, we do have logs on some other clients as well, and this kind of lists some of the uh, logs that are associated with those. Again, I'm not planning on reading all of these. I just want them to be here so that when you have access to the slides, if you're having trouble sleeping at night, you can look through here and memorize all of these, right? I'm sure a question like this would be on the test. Boy, I sure hope not. I haven't seen the test yet, so I don't know. <laughs> I wouldn't think it would be, though. Um, other logs. Uh, the PC agent, guest agent logs, these are logs that can be associated with them, like I said, if you have um, extended logging turned on. Okay, that's enough for these eye charts. Let's look at some real world examples. I'm going to show you a couple of different logging examples where we kind of had to dig through the logs to figure out what was going on. So the first issue is we had a client connectivity failure, right? The end user was actually connecting through a tenant broker. They would log in successfully, they would see the applications that were published, but then when they launched an application, it would fail. And they get kind of this warning or this message, right? The connection was ended because of a network error. Okay. You're like, well, my network's up. I can, you know, got everything all the way through. What's going on here? Right? That could be anything. What do you mean a network error? Okay. So let's go ahead and take a look at the logs and see if we can get a little bit better information about what's going on. So if we look at the controller log, we kind of pulled it up. Unfortunately, we didn't have to parse through a whole lot of data here. And if we read down through the controller log, I can see that, you know, I was just testing it with the admin. It hadn't rolled out in production yet. So admin at vCloud was logging on. It was successful. And then, hey, look at that. Look at this piece, right? Wants to launch application number two. Remember, all the applications programmatically have a number associated with it. That's how we kind of keep track of it. And it went to the server. And 3389 was the port is unavailable. That's interesting. Okay. It's having trouble making an RDP connection to the server is kind of how I repeat this. And that would be, remember where we make the RDP connection to the server? Let's keep in mind where that is. Right? We're coming in and out of the load balancer off port 80 or 443. Right? And that means we're going into the secure client gateway off port 80 or 443. And 3389 would exist only between the gateway and the remote desktop server, I guess, or the VDI instance, if you're doing that, or even a remote PC. 
PC. This was a terminal server, so RDSH. So it's something between the gateway and the terminal server where that port is failing. And we can add in the factor that remember this is a tenant broker. So it's kind of new and you're thinking, okay, is this something going on with the tenant broker that's causing a problem? And you kind of step back and you look at the architecture of a tenant broker. Well, let's get back to fundamentals. Just because we added more icons in here, and more pieces and parts, doesn't mean that the fundamentals change. I'm still making an RDP connection from port 3039 on a gateway to my remote resource, remote desktop server, VDI, PC, or whatever. So I'm still making that connection. So that's the piece that failing. And what happened was he'd forgotten to open up the port on the firewall on that tenant. Right. You got to have 3039 open on that internal firewall. This should be an internal firewall, not a public facing firewall, by the way, just in case you're wondering, the public facing firewalls should be in front of the uh, tenant broker gateways. Not here. So this is just an internal firewall. So you need to have 3039 open. He forgot to open it. He could have used a different port too and just made sure that he specified in the gateway and the terminal server and the firewall all that would have to link up if he used like 3390 or something like that but the default of course is 3039 so that kind of helped us figure out what was going on with that right okay it was the something with the rdp port and then you got to think about where that goes all right let's take another one this one actually happened to me personally uh, the Parallels client was working fine if I just use it directly, but when I was using the HTML5 interface, it would randomly fail. And I get this error. And this actually is the same error that we saw, um, by the way, when we did the SAML test, right? You made a typo in the, uh, in the HTML5 forwarding, and that would cause this problem. But I hadn't done that, right? It was still at the defaults. It's an internal lab. I wasn't going through anything too funky. But I was getting this where sometimes it would work and sometimes it wouldn't. And the agents all reported OK in the console. So I took a little bit of a shortcut on this one. I actually grabbed that uh, error at the bottom. 404 not found. It's not helpful. But RAS Secure Client Gateway HTTP forwarding is disabled. And I plugged that into our online knowledge base. And what do you know? I came up with a knowledge base article. So I go to the knowledge base article and see what's going on. And it says, oh, well, you got this component called node.exe, and it should be uh, running in task manager and present on the server. OK. So I went and took a look and looked at both my gateways. Gateway 1 was fine. But gateway 2, guess what? Node.exe wasn't running on my secondary gateway. All right, so that explains the randomness, right? It's running on one gateway, but not the other. The help is Ron Robbins, so sometimes it worked, sometimes it didn't. And that node.exe only affects the HTML5 interface, which explains why the client would work, but HTML5 wouldn't. So to do a quick fix, I simply just ran a repair on the affected system. I ran the RAS installer, it popped up, it gave me the option to do repair. And by the way, you don't have to hunt around to find that RAS installer, we copy it. Uh, to a target, right? This was a uh, gateway two. I had pushed the uh, the gateway two, and so it put the RAS installer on the local on that uh, secondary gateway, and then and it ran it from there. So it wasn't enough to push all that data across the uh, network. And so I just went into C program files x86 parallels application server on my target system, and there's the installer. Run that, run a repair, and it fixed the issue. Okay, so that worked, but what the heck happened right why why did that fail what was going on so maybe if i went into the logs i could get a little bit more information about what what kind of was happening there so let's go to the logs right we've got the html5 interface random maybe it's the gateway so a good place to start would be the gateway log so i look in the gateway log i start kind of cruising through that and i find this section here fail to create the process node.exe and then i look through there and it's got the js file didn't work. Uh, I don't find the file specified. Effectively, it's telling me that node.exe isn't on the server, and that's why it failed. Well, okay, I already knew that, right? So the gateway is telling me what I already knew. The next step, I go over, and maybe it was something to do with the installation process. So I take a look at that MS, the RAS MSI log, try to look through that, and that also really didn't have a whole lot of information because the installer ran it completed successfully. It didn't crash. That's really what that's looking at. And I know the gateway's up because, like I said, it was reporting up in the uh, in the dashboard. And also, I was able to make connections through the RAS client, which is this one piece node.exe. So let's dig a little bit deeper. 
and I went to the setup CA dot log. Remember, this is the log that actually tells me what goes on during the setup process. And I start looking there and I see something about node.exe and access is denied. So something was preventing that from going on. All right. And that's telling me. So I've got something kind of wonky on that server that was interfering with the setup process and it could be interfering with something else. Typically, when we see something like that, Right, it's a permissions issue on the target server. Remember, the gateways don't necessarily have to be a member of the domain. Perhaps the account that you use because it prompts you to type in didn't have all the permissions you thought it did, or they got changed or something. Another one might be that antivirus is interfering with the install. If you've got really aggressive antivirus, you might need to create some exclusions. The exclusions are listed in our best practices document. Um, in my case, actually, it was just a little bug that we've identified where sometimes it kind of fails, but it was kind of giving me a big head scratcher. I submitted that over to the development team to fix it. But most likely, if you see something like that, like I said, it would come back to permissions or antivirus, or as I said, in this case, if you turn out, you know, you get to that knowledge base article and see that node.exe is running, as we saw earlier, you can get that same error because you made a typo in the web redirection page, right, under a uh, farm and um, gateways and then the web tab. Okay, so that's a couple of examples of how you might dig through the logs and an introduction to the logs themselves. Another common one, well, it's not too common, but something that can happen is an application, excuse me, you'll publish an application and the app will launch, but it just won't display correctly, right? It just doesn't look right. Other times the app will fail to launch, it starts to launch and just, and it's just one particular app, right? For other apps launch, maybe you launch like a test app and that launch is perfect from the server, but it's just this one application I can't get to launch. Or the other one that I've seen sometimes happen is you publish just an app, you launch the app and it breaks out of the app and suddenly you're looking at the full desktop, which is not what you're going for. You just kind of wanted to do the app. What often can cause this is a shell issue. All right, and what's a shell? just in case you don't know well you know an app has to kind of run inside of something right and you say well it's running in windows yeah i know but the display piece it has to run inside of something the default shell that we all know and love is right the windows shell it's the explorer shell get the full desktop apps run in that it's their native habitat however when we're doing remote applications and publishing applications you need to replace that windows shell with something else you got to have a different shell because we don't want them to have the full desktop. And Parallels can take advantage of two different shells. Our native shell is called MemShell. So if you don't do anything and just publish applications, you're using MemShell. That's ours. You also might have heard of Remote App. Remote App, of course, Microsoft uses for a bunch of different things, including products. But Remote App also is a shell. It's a Microsoft application only shell. It's the shell that Microsoft uses to um, put their applications in when you use just the basic Microsoft native tools to publish applications. Well, Parallels can take advantage of either of these, right? And it's a big advantage because sometimes an app will work with one and not the other. The vast majority of applications out there will work with either one. It really makes no difference and it works and just goes fine. But some applications prefer Parallels MemShell and other applications prefer Microsoft's remote app. So and I'll show you where the setting is when we kind of do a demo. I'll show you a quick picture and then do, the, do a quick demo on that as well. But and so it's kind of more of an art almost than a science about which one you should use. Right. Um, because they, I said those that the little failures up there I was talking about at the top, I've seen happen both ways. And I have also seen this. I had a couple of customers get really lucky. They were having an application fail with Parallels MemShell, so they turned on Remote App, and then Remote App fixed that application, but then they had another application failed. So one was compatible with MemShell and one was compatible with Remote App. Well, um, this actually can be set per server. So the solution here was simply to break this application those two applications onto two different remote desktop servers. Doesn't change your Parallels licensing, by the way. Remember, everything's included. And it would set one server to use remote app and one to use uh, MemShell, and that would fix it. Uh, like I said, um, you know, that third bullet I kind of skipped over there, remote app 
only works with Windows clients. That's one thing to kind of keep in mind. It's a Windows construct, and that's a limitation of that. So remote app, if you have Windows clients and something works with remote app, it'll work. But otherwise, um, um, if you're using a non-Windows app, you're, you're going to have to use Memshell. It's the only way, right? So if you're using HTML5 only, not the HTML5 integrated with a client, but HTML5 only, you're using Memshell. If you're running off a of Mac, Chromebook, iOS, Android, anything like that, Linux, you're using Memshell. If you're running off of a Windows client, you might be able to use either one, uh, depending on the setting that you set. So where's the setting? Um, you know, by the way, if the apps still don't launch correctly, um, it's just not going to let itself be stuffed into a shell. It's not going to do it. And that's when you're kind of looking at art and have to go to the full desktop or BDI like that. There's a few other tricks that you can kind of fight with in there, like uh, some JavaScript apps have um, some issues with, uh, I think, setting about icons or something under advanced settings. There's a knowledge base article on that if you just go type Java sets, uh, Java apps. But you know, and support is very talented at getting other apps. But this is a quick one that you can try very, very fast. Just change that setting, log off, log back on, and see what happens. So it's just a really quick one that you can instead of uh, uh, kind of having to go outside to deal with it. But support is pretty talented, like I said, at getting uh, some other application compatibility issues out. So to look where to set that, you just go to farm, already session hosts, already session host, and go to properties. Again, there's that group defaults, inherit default settings. You can set this server by server, or you can set them on all of them. And then there's a checkbox under agent settings tab. Right? So go to that agent settings tab. It says use remote app if available. It's off by default. And again, the if available is because if it's a non-Windows client, it won't be able to use a uh, remote app, and it will default and fail back to um, Memshell. So even if you turn it on and you're connecting from a Mac, uh, it won't just shut it down or go into the ether. It'll watch it using Memshell, which may or may not be working for you, just depending on how things go. But that's that's kind of what's happening there, just in case. Uh, the other thing, I'll show you this too when I do a quick uh, demo of this, is there's a um, overlay icon you may have noticed, right? So the Memshell overlay icon is the standard parallels icon, which you can change in Teams if you like. But it's a little uh, parallels double hot dog logo down there. Remote app has their own icon which is put in place, and you can see it's just kind of an arrows pointing at each other off center a little bit. That's the Microsoft remote app icon. So if you walk into somebody's environment and you look at their app that they've launched with the parallels client, just looking at the icon, if it's got that remote app icon, you know they've turned remote app on for some reason or other. And again, obviously, this is only on Windows clients that this works. Okay, with all that, why don't we jump over to um, uh, to a server side and let's do um, an actual demo and take a look at some of this a little closer. Okay, so let's take a look at uh, some of the interface and the tools that we have in action here. So I'm going to go ahead and log into the Parallels console. And here we are. So let's deal with the remote app first, the remote app settings. So if you go to farm and then RD session hosts, and then I've got a few different RD session hosts here. Let's just pick on these two. I'm going to take the second one. I'm going to right click and go to properties, agent settings. I'm going to have this one not set to inherit the defaults. That way we can uh, modify it independently of another one. And then right here is the checkbox, use remote app if available. Go ahead and click that. And now this server will be using remote app. And if we look at number one, my first server up here, agent settings, it has remote app off. So it's just going to use Memshell exclusively. So let's go publish a couple of applications. We can look at the difference. So I'll go to publishing, and I'll go to add. Application, already session host. I'll choose installed applications. Next, and for individual servers, I'm going to choose number one. This is the one without remote app. Next, quick Windows inventory list. And oh, let's grab calculator, right? So I'll go next, next, and finish. 
And then we'll go back and I'm going to publish calculator again, only this time I'll use the other server. So next, party session host, installed applications, next. And this time we'll pick the remote app server, next. And calculator, next, and next, finish. And then for this one, right, it's easy to get confused. Let me make sure this is the correct one. So from publish from, that one's going to number two, which is the remote app. So under the application tab, I'll give it um, a name, remote app calculator. Now we'll kind of be able to tell. And then we always click apply. Okay, so with that, let's go ahead and log in like an end user would. I'll just go into the admin, uh, the web interface and I'll log in. Okay, and you can see the two apps, the remote app calculator and the calculator. So if I just double click on the regular calculator and there we go, calculator. You can see and it's got the parallels little logo on it and now I'll go to remote app calculator. And we can see the difference. Now it's actually taking a little bit to log in again, right? Because it's having to create a session on the other server. Uh, since I've got remote app and non-remote app, it's forcing me to two different servers. It can't keep the session open on the same server. So now I have the other one open. So I'll minimize. If calculator, calculator, and you can see the remote app logo. Right. It's got that little uh, Microsoft logo down there, and then here's the Parallels logo here. That's really all it is, and from a functional standpoint, it looks kind of the same to me, right? Um, what's the difference? Well, in an app like Calculator and most apps, nothing. But if your app isn't displaying right or anything like that, that remote app setting can be very, very useful. Okay, so let's go back in and actually look at some of the auditing and logging functions. So for those, I'm gonna go back under farm and then I'll go down to settings and let's deal with uh, global logging first. Right, and this is exactly what we saw. I can select multiple items here if I want and then to configure logging, uh, standard extended remote for both uh, and I can set the time here, right? Nothing too too crazy here, and then I can always retrieve them. And again, that puts it in this nice little zip file for me that I can stick wherever I want. Okay, a couple other settings that might be uh, kind of useful that we can look at. One is back under auditing. You actually have the ability to audit all these uh, settings and processes, right? Um, here. So as changes are made to any of these things that affect uh, these particular processes, they're going to get audited or logged. And I can add more up here if I want with a little blue plus, right? I can add another process and put it in here if I'd like. So auditing by default is disabled. So you have to come here and turn it on. I enabled it just so we can kind of see something and then I can click view and view audit. And there's not going to be too much in here, but you can see you know, playing with a few things kind of going on. And it'll also show you, you know, if you really look at it, who did it. And of course, I log on mostly as the administrator. Uh, it's probably a good best practice to not just do that. Have everybody use their own individual accounts if you're going to do auditing. Then you can see who changed what. But I can also see users logging in as well. So that's the auditing function. Beyond that, one other setting while I'm here uh, that people kind of don't think about necessarily or realize was added is under client settings. So I'm under farm settings, client settings. I can show a password expiration reminder, right? So end users log in, they get that, uh, hey, your password's expiring, you might want to change it. Because remember, if I'm working out of a system like this, uh, just inside the web interface, even with or without the console, how am I going to change my password, right? How do we even know it does? So this will be a reminder that pops up. And then this little user icon up here, I can click on that. There's a change password. So that's how a user actually can change passwords. You can do that from the client as well. One of the little tip here that I don't know if too many people look at is this little settings. I don't come across this very often, 
but the settings are kind of held in little cookies. So as long as you allow uh, cookies on the local uh, workstation, it'll remember these. But you can turn this on or off. The big one, and I haven't seen this in a while because we've made so many improvements to the HTML client, but every so often there'll be a wonky application where the keyboard just doesn't work right. I've seen this where it's like got a, uh, it was a big EMR app and it had a hard-coded uh, field and it just wasn't recognizing the numbers. It, it would only take numerical values, nothing else. They could kind of click in it and use the up and down arrow to toggle the numbers, but they couldn't actually type the number in there. We switched it to PC keyboard and it lit up and it worked. Uh, the default universal keyboard, which is better. Again, the HTML5 client has been improved so much that you probably, I haven't had to do this in a long, long, long time, like years. Uh, but just so you know, that's there if you need to do it. And there's some other settings as well. Okay. The other thing too, don't forget to configure as we go through this is under notifications. I can sub, come in here and click on the blue plus and then I can add all sorts of notifications. This will notify an administrator um, specifically under the email. If you've configured the email server quality within um, administration, you don't integrate with your mail server and then put in the email address of administrators. They can get notifications about what happens. You also can write little scripts that also will tell you um, what's going on there. Okay, so let's move off this one. These were just simple little things, but here's a feature that I'm not sure too many people are aware of. If I go down to the administ uh, administration icon and then the settings audit, I can see the changes that were made and I actually have the ability to revert some of them. So what do I mean by that? I can go up here to publishing and I can delete, um, let's delete the remote app calculator. And while I'm at it, I'm also going to delete the regular calculator, right? Clean up a little bit. And then I'm going to click apply. And I'm thinking to myself, oops, I didn't mean to delete the second calculator. And obviously, a single app isn't a big deal. But if you've got larger settings, this could be a pain. And you're like, oh, now I've got to publish it again and do all that stuff. Well, I could just go to the administration tab, or excuse me, the administration icon category here. I can go to the settings on it. And then when I refresh, I will see um, the delete, right, of calculator. And this is calculator, not the remote app calculator. So it lets me know that that happened. These other ones are essentially me click, clicking apply. So I could click on this and then I could go up under tasks up here in the top right. View the entry. That's what I would like to do. And then from here, I can see the actual changes that were made. You know, if I want to get into that level, but I also just click revert and revert. Yep, I want to revert the changes and then um, click apply. And then now if I go back under publishing, a calculator was restored, right? So very, very cool. And then again, that was under administration and uh, settings on it. Uh, a couple other little features that we've added in here that may help you a little bit is under farm. And then if I click on site, you know, here's the dashboard that we all know and love that we've done such a nice job on. Right, you can see, but I can click on a server up here, any one of them, and then uh, click on tasks and under tools. We've added all these windows management tools for the server. I can RDP right to my server to deal with it from here instead of, oh, I need to go check that out. Let me launch an RDP window. And then what's that address again? I can just go, okay, let's, I need to go look at the server and log on. So you go to tools, remote desktop and do that. I can pull up the computer management, the services, look at the event viewer, um, PowerShell, in the host, you know, nuts that I can even reboot and shut down from here. So those are some very nice handy shortcuts that we've integrated in the environment uh, for server management. And the last one I want to show you that can be of use is don't forget about this little information um, icon down here. Support uses this a lot. Um, it provides similar information to what's in the dashboard, but it does give us a little bit more, right? I can see these servers 
and I can see their status, of course, of the agent, CPU, memory, disk, read and write, all that I've already got, but it kind of puts it up in one place. But if I scroll down and look at a bit closer to it, um, I can see that the services started at this time and date, and that was also the last time that the operating system booted. So I can see how long it's up, and if there's any uh, unhandled exceptions or anything like that kind of going on. And I can do that for all the components across my entire farm. And then if I move to some of them, like the gateways, I, I can get in some more information about it, like, uh, you know, the current client connections and SSL connections and things like that that are going on on the gateway. Hey, why isn't this gateway being used, but the others are being pounded? You know, you could take a look at all, all sorts of information that's in here. So all this is very, very useful. I can even get down and see the sessions on the RD session host. Some of this, of course, you can find in other screens, but other pieces, um, it kind of puts it up in a nice spot right here where you can kind of take a look at it. And we have more than earned another break at this point. So let's go ahead and take that. I'm gonna put the timer up for about 15 minutes. Um, probably about another 45, 50 minutes when we're back. It won't go quite the full hour, I don't think so. Let me go ahead and put that timer up and uh, hey, have a good break, everybody.
Okay, welcome back. Hope everybody had a good break. We're going to get into the last section here. We're going to talk about some uh, additional features and functionality. Um, these are pretty cool features, actually, a lot of uh, interesting things. They just weren't quite big enough to warrant their own section, or at least long enough in terms of the time it takes to introduce them. Okay, so let's start with Microsoft Azure VDI RDSH provisioning or auto scaling, if you will. We've had this capabilities in our on-prem hypervisors, Hyper-V, vCenter, Nutanix Acropolis scale, et cetera. We've had that for a while. And what we've done is extended this functionality uh, to Microsoft Azure version 17.1. So we have the ability to scale and manage workloads on demand now directly in Azure. So we can kind of scale up your VDI environment, scale it down. And the same thing with uh, the RDSH workloads. So you can auto provision and auto scale these. Again, it's a very similar mechanism to what we're doing with our on-prem capabilities, but it does have a few Azure-specific features and functionalities in them. Okay, so let's take a look at this in action. This is a uh, RAS environment, obviously, that's in my lab, and I want to show you how to initiate the connection with Azure. So just like you would normally do adding up on-prem hypervisor, I'd go to farm, BDI, you can see I've already got a couple of hypervisors in here already that are on-prem, vCenter, as well as uh, scale computing. So you can still mix and match. We don't tie you down to one. If you kind of migrate environment, end up in a hybrid kind of situation, you can certainly do that. And then just like normal, I would go up here and click on the little blue plus in the top right. And what's different is here. Instead of just having the virtualization for on-prem hypervisors, which we support, obviously very many of them, then there's cloud computing. It's a new option. When I go to next, it takes me to the information page to get, uh, continue on with this process. The type is Microsoft Azure and it's grayed out. Why do we do it like that? Well, we left it as cloud computing because obviously we're going to add more cloud providers as time goes by. Probably the next one we'll be adding will be AWS. I, I don't have a time frame on when that would happen right now, but Azure is currently supported. Okay, so this is what it looks like as you initiate it. And what I want to do is switch over to um, a different environment where I've already got the Azure hypervisor configured for us. Okay, so this environment already has the integration with the Azure hypervisor already completed. Um, everything we're doing, by the way, is in this knowledge base article that you guys can follow along with. But um, in this farm, I've got a tenant and I've joined it to the hypervisor up here using Azure. Okay, so let's go ahead and go into the properties of this. We can review what was done. And you can see that I've given it a name. It has the authentication URL and the management uh, URL with it. And then two very important pieces, uh, the tenant ID and the subscription ID. The subscription ID, you can have more than one subscription to Azure and integrate that if you'd like to. Uh, okay, and then we move on over to the credentials tab. And for the credentials, we're using the application ID and the application key. And that, if you don't know what that is, there's some Azure documentation where we have it in our own documentation to describe you about where to get that. But that's what allows us to integrate in and actually see the virtual machines running up in Azure and then start um, doing the cloning and templating process. So once this is done, I can actually see all the virtual machines running in the environment. I've got just a few running in our little lab, but I do have two Windows 10 images here, eight and nine. And they're being controlled by a template. They've already been deployed. So I'll go ahead and click OK, and we'll go over to templates and look at the template settings here. Right? You can see that it's ready, it's been deployed, and it's, it's finished. So it's already finished uh, deploying them and it's be able to be used, of course, and published. But um, let's go ahead and take a look inside it. So I'll go up to tasks and then properties. And then here, you know, you can choose whether to leave an unused virtual machine, the max gas, the available buffer, and I can also give it a name, which I did to increment it. And then on the advanced settings, I can deploy about uh, the resource group. And then this is very cool, right? I can look at the VM size. I chose standard A2. But you can pick, actually, the type of Azure virtual machine that you want to deploy to, including machines that use GPUs or eGPUs, right? So they're all available to us to deploy on. And then, of course, the hard disks as well, right, if I want to. Uh, choose solid state or just a traditional HTD. Both of those are available. And then for preparation, we use RAS prep still or sys prep. They do the same thing. RAS preps a little bit quicker because it doesn't require as many reboots. That's really the main difference between those two. 
And once this is all set, I can just click OK, apply, let it deploy, and then the uh, the template now, the virtual machines, they're, they're ready to be published. And to do that, let me move back over to our other environment real quick. So uh, to publish them, it's just like we always would do. There's nothing really that changed here. I go to publishing and then a little blue plus down here and add. And then I can, let's just do a desktop since we're talking about BDI, I would do next. The virtual desktop next and then I give it a name and then just like we've always done a specific template and then that would tie it into the RAS templates. The other thing you can do though also you know, on Azure and our other hypervisors as well on prem that we support, I can do a remote desktop server so I could publish an application or a desktop off of those and that would allow us to auto scale these. Uh, the slick way to do this is just a little bit different. I would go next. I could just pick one um or all servers in a site but that doesn't really get me to the cool auto scaling features i want to show you the way to do that is to create a group so i would go to groups pick a group and i've already created this group and i just called it uh, cleverly auto scaling so we could show you here and it's the group that ties that template um, to the application or the desktop that i'm publishing for remote desktop servers so let me back out of this because i already have one created and i'll just go up to farm and then already session hosts and then inside the groups, this is where I do that. So um, you can see that I've got the auto scaling group created. And if I go to right, if I just um, go into the properties of this group, and here's where I would add the template, right? I would go and check on the RD session host based on a template, click this, and it would show me um, the list of templates that I have available. And then as it deploys more virtual machines, it would show me actually what members are listed down here. And then the real magic is occurring under the template settings. Where here is where I can set the uh, the thresholds, right? Um, once it starts reaching a certain workload threshold, deploy another virtual machine, deploy another virtual machine so I can scale up. And then I can drain an unassigned service from the group when it reaches below a certain percentage. This works in conjunction with that uh, delete unused VMs after a certain period of time so I can scale down, which is important in a cloud environment, right? When I, I'm paying rent on virtual machines, it's not a sunk cost. So let's switch gears here. One of the most anticipated features in remote application server was the addition of uh, some integration with Google Authenticator. We actually added this back in version 17.0 but it's so cool, right? It's uh, this is a, a two-factor authentication service that's really easy to use. It's super simple. I'll show you that in demo. And of course, it's free. I really like free. Okay, so let's hop on over to a quick demo. This is really super simple to set up and use, and I'll show you that. So I've got a uh, workstation right here, and I've got the Parallels client on one side, and then I've got an Android phone image up on the other, so I can show you the whole process. Just to show you things are working, I go ahead and log in normally, and there's my applications that I'm entitled to, right, that have been published. Click around all that. So let me go ahead and log off, and then we'll switch over to the RAS Administrator Console. And I'll go up to uh, Connection and click on Multi-Factor Authentication and then the Provider, and you can see we've added Google Authenticator to the list, so it's there along with all the others. Always click Apply. Okay, that was hard. Okay, so let's go back over to the client side. And now when I log in, right, it's going to come up and it pops me up with the little barcode that I need to scan. So I'll just go over to my phone. I've already got the Authenticator app installed on it. I'll launch that and then we'll, um, we'll go ahead and scan that code in. Scan barcode. There we go. Take a picture of it. That's it, right? And then I just click OK. I've done this for the first time. It'll always remember now that this phone is attached to this uh, account, or the Google Authenticator account is attached to this. I'll type in that one time password, and I'm in. And then there's my applications, right? And everything that I've got, I'll launch, oh, I don't know, WordPad. Right? That one's always good. And WordPad will pop up here in a second. So that is really it. I mean, that's how super simple it is. Uh, since we're here, let me go ahead and close this off, and then you can turn it off if you'd like, right? Let me get out of WordPad, and I'll log off my client again. 
And if you want to disable that, you can just switch back over to the administrator console. Yeah, that's because I closed out of the uh, WordPad. And connection, multi-factor authentication, back to none, apply. That's it. Okay, go back to my desktop again real quick. And yeah, here we go. Okay, so it works. Yeah, right? No multi-factor authentication. The reason I did that is let's go over and I'm going to show you how it works kind of on the uh, Android phone here. So let me log off here. And then I've also got the Parallels client on the Android phone. So I'll just log out. Yep, there it is. And I'll make a connection. And you can see the phone. Oh, there we go. Phone actually is working as well on Android. This is the Android client, by the way, of course. So let's go ahead and turn on multi-factor authentication. So back to the RAS admin console, back to connection, multi-factor authentication, Google Authenticator, click apply. I'll get out of this, back to my phone. I'll launch the client from here. Now it's prompting me for my one-time password again, right? So I'll go back into Authenticator, open it up, and let's set 018223. See if I can remember that. Back to the client, it's easier when it's on two screens. 018223. Okay, there we go. There's my apps. Okay, so the basics are just really, really super simple as you saw, but I want to show you a couple other quick things on the administrator side that you can do here since this is the advanced training after all, right? If I go up to uh, connection and then multi factor authentication, I go down to Google Authenticator, just like we're doing the settings button over here. Let's explore that a little bit. So if I click on settings, I can do a few things here. First of all, look at that. I can rename the type of authenticator I want from Google Authenticator. Why would I do that? The new feature is listed as Google Authenticator, but it actually works with any OTP provider out there. So if you're just using Microsoft's, uh, we've had support for Microsoft Azure in the Radius setting for a while now, but you could use Microsoft's just OTP or anybody else, and then just change the name here from Google Authenticator to Microsoft OTP or whatever you're using, right? That's open like that, and it'll work. It um, makes your end users from getting confused. Uh, you also can set an enrollment period so that it only works during this period of time. And then if you have a user that gets kind of um, messes something up or changes like that, you can reset them and they can, uh, they'll can they have to go through the little scan the barcode process again. And there's also ways to get in here and do some um, import users as well. So these are some things that you can dig into a little bit on it. Um, what it added is this right here, user or group exclude list, right? We've always had the ability to exclude, most people would do it off the client IP exclude list, but other ones exclude options as well. You know, you're at work, I don't challenge you for two-factor authentication, you're at home or Starbucks or something, and I do, but now I can also do it by group. So I can add a group in here this group uh, does not get challenged. And so, um, you know, some people are working on something more sensitive and they need two factor. Other people perhaps aren't. It's just, you know, in the office work, whatever. Um, it's, you can exclude it by group also. Okay, and with that, we've wrapped up Google Authenticator. Okay, now I want to show you about a very cool feature that was introduced, I believe it was in version 17. Uh, it's a stealth feature, and I don't think it was very well documented or even advertised. It just kind of showed up in the interface, but it is really cool. It's been something I've been wanting for a long time. And it's under the publishing category, and it's the ability to actually create administrative folders. Right. So let's say that your uh, your environment is growing. Your it's been very successful in implementation. You're bringing more people on all the time. Right. You're publishing more and more apps for different groups. And this list is not looking like mine in a little lab, but it's starting to get very long. And you got another problem too. You've been organizing it, right? And so when you log in, it's very well organized so far. But it's all in folders, and a lot of the end users are wanting to actually just have them presented uh, up here in the, the front. Now, I mean, they could come in here and star, you know, applications that they use quite frequently, and then access them right here kind of in a little favorites thing. 
Um, but they really would like to just, let me go ahead and clear that before I forget about it, but they really would like to uh, just log in and see them right here, right, without having to go into any of the folders or anything like that. But yet that kind of breaks your organizational thing because you're probably doing filtering at the folder level, right? I mean, I'm not applying any filters here, but I could be. Right, you're filtering at the folder level for all the applications that are underneath it instead of having to go, you know, app by app by app. So what we can do actually is create administrative folders. So if I want to create a couple of different groups in here, I could create, um, you know, first of all, I can just right click and duplicate what I've already got. And in this one, I can just, um, I'll just rename this uh, to, um, I don't know, sales apps. And then I'll just leave Microsoft Office. I'll call this, um, you know, admin apps, admins, Outlook, Word, and PowerPoint too, right? But for the admin apps, maybe I also want to create a special subfolder in here. And you, you can actually nest folders in here and call it domain apps. Or, or uh, yeah, we'll just call it domain apps. That'll work, right? And I can say use for administrator purposes and finish. And then I've got a couple of applications that an admin might want to use, such as I'd like to start publishing the remote application server console. And maybe they need to get into Active Directory users and computers. And then um, I'll go over here, and I've already got it set for uh, folder tab for use for administrator purposes. And then up here at the admin level, under filtering, uh, this is going to be allowed only for, let's say, domain admins. It's the only people that need really to get into Active Directory users and computers, right? So domain admins. So that takes care of that. And this other one, I've got, um, I called them, well, let's just, let's rename this. I'll call this um, productivity apps. And I also want to drag the, uh, the mission critical, uh, let's call this, um, there we go. We'll call this mission critical sales apps. Right, calculator, WordPad, and uh, Paint, they need that. So I'll drag this under there and nest that. And I'll leave that in there so that they feel very, um, sales are very important that they got their own folder. But for this folder, I'm gonna use it for administrator purposes and I'll go ahead and click apply. So now when I go back to my browser here, and this would work also through the client, if I refresh, see, get rid of that folder. So the folder up here is productivity apps, it's gone. I've actually got a folder here called productivity that has nothing in it. Let me get rid of that because that's confusing things and apply. All right. And then I'll refresh again. That gets rid of app. Get rid of that. I can reorder these a little bit, but now you can see that I've got my office apps right up here in the, the top row where I want to. And then if I log in, um, this person actually is a sales rep and that's why they, they see the sales apps also. If I wanted to nest uh, that one, you know, I could come in here under productivity apps and mission critical sales apps, and I could make this folder for administrator purposes too, um, and then apply. I clicked apply, right, didn't I? I thought I did. Yeah, I clicked apply. And then I just refresh, and then that goes away. And now they're all up here. So it's a way to kind of manage and manipulate. And then obviously, if I log in as, um, break into this. I'll log in as an administrator for this one. Hopefully I didn't fat finger the password, right? Looks like it's good. I see the same set of things, except I also had my admin apps down here, which includes this. And obviously I did some duplication because I'm in a hurry. Uh, doing this, but that's what that administrator purposes folder is. It's a way where I can still apply filtering at the folder level without having to um, present it to the end users. Before, you, the only way to organize it was also to put all the apps in folders and users, and you may have, you know, like a massive app at the top for uh, 
certain people and then the ton of apps behind it and everything was in the folder. So that wasn't so good. So that's an extremely nice uh, feature that you can do. You also can see what you can kind of do some shortcuts in here as I right click and I did duplicate, you know, if it's mostly duplicates, then I could do that and then clean up. And uh, you also notice a lot of people don't take advantage of that. I can do that drag and drop. Remember, that's how I got the Active Directory users and computers in here. And this is another new feature that is kind of a little bit hidden. If this tree gets a little bit big, this is a pane, a window pane that I actually can resize. It's one of the few in uh, the administrator console that I can do, but this was added. So I actually can resize that window as well. And then uh, the other one, this is a cool troubleshooting tool that I'm not sure everybody takes advantage of, but if I was to click on the application and go to the application tab, it has this verify targets and it comes back and it tells me, okay, this is running on one server, which I know and it's okay, as opposed to, oh, I forgot to install it on server two or server three. But I can do that at the folder level simply by right clicking on a folder and going to verify targets. And now it's going to come back and it's going to show me everything in there. And you can see that, um, hey, look at that. I don't have a couple of these tools installed on these other servers. Uh, that's going to create some problems for me. I need to adjust and do that. The other thing that's very cool also is it gets kind of um, confusing who does what. But I, we have an effective access button down here. I can right click. I can put in a user here if I'd like. If I'm filtering by the client device name or the operating system or the IP address, any of those other filters that we can apply, I can go ahead and click view and it'll show me essentially what this person is seeing. Right? You can show only allowed public resources that'll kind of hide it. You can see things that they can't see plus things they can because it's grayed out. Right? So I'm actually, the first option is it's showing me that, oh, admin apps is not available, right? Main West is not a domain admin. I can hide it simply by saying show only public res uh, resources. And now I can say, oh, this is what she sees. Yeah, there's nothing in there that'll get her into trouble. And yeah, these two are critical or something like that. So I can do the, uh, the effective access audit. The one other thing too in here, we, you know, the, um, if I was to right click, it's a shortcut to the settings audit. Or I can come here and go to that settings audit, and this is where I can do a revert. So if I'd done something that I didn't want to do, I could highlight that item, and like I didn't want to get rid of the productivity folder, and I could come back here and just revert it, right? Um, and then there it's back. I could have done this as we looked at before by going down to the administration tab and then the settings audit and, and doing it that way. But in places that you can revert, and it's not everywhere in the console, the places that you can, you often can right click and just go to settings audit and, and find it that way. So that also is a very powerful uh, little shortcut that you guys can use. There's actually one other really cool uh, little feature and shortcut that I wanted to show you that um, I don't think a lot of people take advantage of either. This is for a more seamless experience for your users. If I was to uh, right click on this, as we've been doing, you notice there's also a site default setting here. In the site default setting, it takes over the last few tabs in the application uh, properties, if I was to go into an application directly. But the display settings, the license settings, and then the shortcut settings. All right. The shortcut settings, now this piece here only works for the Parallels client directly. It doesn't work with HTML5 interface. It also doesn't work with, um, you know, the browser integrated HTML5. You have to use the client directly, but it can give your users a more, um, a more seamless experience. I could just click this box here, create shortcut in the target folder. Here's the default, default folder for the start menu, but you can obviously change that as you want. Um, I also can put it in the auto start folder as well, so that the application will launch when they log in in the morning. All right, or I can do the shortcut on the desktop. But effectively, what that does is, again, you have to be running the uh, the Parallels client and have it configured. It can't just be sitting there like um, <clears throat> like it would be just unconfigured in the HTML5 client. But once I've done that, it goes ahead and creates the folder here. If I scroll down, um, there it is, remote application desktops and applications, a remote desktop and applications, and here's all the 
of all the applications right here in the start button. So that gives a very seamless uh, experience with that. If I want to modify that directly, it's like, well, I don't want to put everything in their start button or everything in the folder. That one is an app by app setting. I can come down here and just, uh, let's see, under domain, uh, you know, you don't need the Active Directory Administrator Center in your folder or whatever. So I can come over here to shortcut, shortcuts and say this one does not inherit the default settings and then it, it does whatever here. Or if there's just one or two, I want to put in the start menu. So you can get kind of granular with that. It's just that that site defaults, obviously, you can also access it right here. We'll put them all there. And then here you can exclude the few that you don't want in there. Or if you want to go the other way, I really don't want most of them in there, but there's a couple we'll put in. You can do it that way also. Uh, while I'm here, the display tab also is kind of an interesting uh, folder or excuse me, interesting setting. If I didn't check the inherit defaults, we can see it. It uses the same nomenclature as the other ones. You know, if you've got applications that require specific color depth or resolution, you can do that here. It's usually best to just kind of let the, the application adapt to whatever the client is doing. But this setting right here can be very useful. Wait until all universal printers are redirected before showing the, uh, the application. It actually is can be a little bit of a delay and you know, so it's used for printers. That's what it says, but it also can be a, a bit of a delay when you check that because I, I think of it this way. Suppose you're mapping drives to group policy. Okay, and I uh, And an application depends on, I don't know, the M drive to be there when it launches. What can sometimes happen is the application will launch then group policy will run and then it'll complete and um, then the M drive gets mapped, right? So the application launches faster than group policy can complete. And so the application launches, it completes, it looks at the M drive, there's no M drive and then it fails or throws up errors or something like that. And you're like, well, that stinks. How do I resolve that? Introduce a little bit of a delay. Okay, let's let the application take a little bit longer before it opens, but when it does, the M drive or whatever else it's depending on will be there. Right, so that's good. Um, also, don't forget that the client has the ability to do single sign-on. Right, if I go into tools and options, and you can script all this too. The client can be scripted, by the way. If I go to single sign-on, I can turn it on and reboot. That way, when the user logs in, they're already logged into Parallels, and you can also set the app to start automatically. So then when they log in, they've either got shortcuts on their desktop, they've got um, shortcuts here inside the start menu and they can just go to their applications and launch it's pretty pretty seamless at that point right that's about as, as seamless as you're going to get to an end user in remote application world and i keep thinking of cool things there's one other uh, little topic i want to show you actually two others real quick if i go back into the administrator console and go down into policies you can do this on the client directly but it's always better to write to centrally control things and policies. I'll just go ahead and add a policy. By the way, this is another little feature that snuck in and I don't know was widely publicized, but if I change the object types about what a policy, a RAS policy will apply to, we've added computers. It used to just be kind of groups and users and the built-in security principles. We added computers. So now you can actually tie a policy to a workstation uh, as well as just users and groups. But where I was going with this is under connection in the advanced settings. Here's some timeouts, right, that you can adjust. But to get that truly seamless experience, that's what made me think of it. You see that little RAS connection banner, the ribbon that, that flashes across the screen. And then ultimately, if the app takes a while, it's going to show the uh, it's going to show the desktop, right? The logging into Windows desktop, as you see. If you want to create a really seamless experience, you could hide both of those from the end user simply by jacking this up, you know, to something really high, like, I don't know, 360 seconds or something. What's that, six minutes? 300 is five minutes. You know, don't show that until five minutes. If the app hasn't launched in five minutes, you've got something else going on. And you could do that with a desktop, too. But you combine this with the shortcuts on the desktop and the single sign-on it's going to feel pretty dang close to just a, uh, a local app as opposed to a remote app. 
And the one other one up here that kind of goes with that, um, this was new and was advertised quite a bit, but I always like to circle back to it, is this policy for session pre-launch. This only works with Windows clients, but it can be set one of two ways. The basic way is you, the administrator, are going to kind of set up a schedule. Okay, we're going to, you know, such and such days of the week, you know, it's going to do this and that and whatever. The better way, the cooler way, is really machine learning. And what this will do is, um, as users log in, and it usually takes about two weeks to kind of get fully, uh, fully um, smarted up, I guess, in, in, in doing things, right? Because it's machine learning, but it'll kind of figure out the user's habits, all of them across the entire, uh, the entire site here, and it will start launching the applications in advance. That's why it kind of needs a Windows clients because you've got to have that tie-in, but it'll launch the window, the, whatever they're doing on the server side, it'll launch them in advance. Okay, everybody comes in Monday morning and they're a little late because it's Monday and they show up at 9 a.m. and they all hit the log on button at once and we get a login storm and that creates a lot of stress on our server, okay? Well, machine learning would be, okay, we're gonna have a large number of people coming in and they're launching this application, this application, and that application, usually right at 9 a.m. on Monday morning and then about 8.30 or 8 the rest of the week. Let's get those running in advance. And so it'll kind of stagger that. And so the launches will, will happen before hours, right? So the applications are up and running. And so that A, avoids the, the logon storm, right? So you don't have to size your servers perhaps as, as beefy as you normally would. And the other benefit is for the end users. You know, they log in at 9 and they launch their application. Well, they're connecting to a session that already exists. So they're just reconnecting. So it's very, very fast for the end users. So you had this, you had the hiding of the, the taskbar with the splash window and, and Windows desktop, perhaps if it's really slow, you put the shortcuts on the desktop. Now you're getting pretty seamless, especially with that, um, that single sign-on. Yeah, so I think we covered that enough. Let's, uh, let's move on. All right, so let me show you how delegate permissions works. So if I go into the RAS administrator console, remember again, the goal is that I want like um, a power user or a senior person in a certain department to be able to manage sessions for their department, but not affect other people, right? Maybe the accounting per department has a guy that's really good and he wants to help you out and he wants to manage the sessions like stuck sessions log off users, that kind of stuff in the accounting department, but you don't want them uh, doing anything that would affect sales or IT or anybody else and kicking them off. This is accomplished through the use of themes. Okay, so I go down to farm and I go into themes and I've got a bunch of different themes already allocated in here. So uh, the way to do this is to first, let's limit the theme to just the department. So I'm going to take the reverse theme here and I have a group called silent and I'm going to limit it to just the silent group. So I'll go ahead and click here and apply. So then if I go to Go to my browser and I go to the reverse theme. Only somebody that's a member of the, uh, the silent group can log in. So I'll log in with um, a user called Marilyn, and she is not a member of the silent group. So she tries to log into this theme and she can't do it. She can log into another theme, perhaps, but not this one. However, I've got a Greta here. I'll have her log in, and she is a member of that group and can log in. So I'll have her go log in, you know, let's save her password, and then um, I'll go ahead and have her launch the application so we can get a session open. 
Well, it's going. I'm actually going to have Marilyn log in in a proper team. So this is one that she does have access to. And I'll have her log in. And Marilyn likes to paint. So let's go ahead and get paint open for her. Okay, so Marilyn has paint open. I go back over to um, Greta's window, right? And she has Excel open here. So they're both on. And if I go back to the RAS console, farm already session host, and go to sessions. Quick reverse here, I or refresh here. I can see that both Marilyn and Greta have a session open, All right? But they're in different departments, and I would like somebody to be able to manage that silent group that's not an IT person. So if I go to farm and themes, what I can do is just right click anywhere in the blank area and delegate permissions. So I'll go ahead and delegate permissions, and then I want to pick somebody that's in that silent group. So I can come up here and go plus. That'll add an account. I'm going to add Charlie to be the uh, administrator, or at least the, the kind of the help desk person for this group. So I'm going to add him in. And now he shows up in this accounts over here. And I can determine what Charlie can and can't do. If I click anything up in this top section up here, you immediately say, oh, manage sessions. These are global permissions. OK, they are going to mean that Charlie can now manage sessions across the entire site. I don't really want him to do that. I want to come down here to just reverse and have him manage sessions just on this one theme. So it's just the people that are logging into this theme, which should be just the silent department or the silent group. I'll go ahead and click OK. Yep, and it's telling me that the new positions, uh, you know, has to log out and log in, obviously, before this permissions take effect for Charlie. So I'll click OK and apply. OK, now that that's done, let's see what we can actually do with this. So let me minimize this, and I'll go back to my web browser. I'll come in here, and um, you can see Marilyn's logged in here. And then here's Greta. I'm going to go to a new tab, and I'm going to launch the web console. And you can see a couple of users, Greta and then Mae West. Mae West is in there because uh, she hadn't logged off and back on when I made all those theme changes. Normally, you wouldn't see her, but she's grayed out, so we actually can't do anything with her anyway. But ultimately, she would disappear on him. But I can go up to Actions for Greta, and I can disconnect, log off. I can send her messages, things like that. So very nice help desk type um, things. And if you have like different um, clients or tenants, you could even have somebody on site that kind of does this so they wouldn't have to bother you so much for basic stuff. Okay, so that's the help desk functionality. But in version 18, we increased the web management portal to be much more functional overall. So if you log in as somebody with full administrator privileges, let me go ahead and type this in and then sign in. You have a much more full functioned uh, web console here. Right, I can start up at the, uh, you can see all the different tools that I can get in here. I can start up and look at the site overview for gateways and publishing agents. I can go down and look at the dash infrastructure, sessions, publishing, site settings, and I can even go into help and support. I can get quick access to technical documentation, contact, parallel support, etc. All right, so much more full featured. If I go up to site, um, you actually can see what's going on in the environment. I can see not just the user sessions, but the gateways, the publishing agents, the remote desktop servers, virtual desktops. The infrastructure looks a lot like our dashboard, but I can start with remote desktop servers. I can manage certificates. I can get into the gateways information here. I can actually add and delete these components from here as well. Right? I can drill in and get a lot more information and detail about them right from the web interface. And we also have a separate session screen. So unlike the management console, the session screen was broken off on its own category, making it again easier for uh, help desk personnel to get in. And inside here, I can uh, search and uh, also change some of the categories about what's being displayed just kind of right off the bat um, for what the people will see. And then publishing. I can actually publish resources here. So you can see what's actually already published. I can modify uh, some of the settings, such as filtering the application, etc. I can publish new apps, new folders. 
you can walk right through here, just go to publishing, application. Uh, let's do it full desktop, actually. I'll go to next. I'll just take the default here is fine. And next, um, put it in this group. This is the default RD session host group. Next, uh, you have to give it a name. So I'll just type in, uh, you know, desktop. How exciting, right? And you know, I'll leave the rest of the defaults here and just go next. And um, there we go, right? It's been published. So much, much more powerful feature here. And then you can kind of look at some of the other settings as well. I can get in here and uh, change FS logics around universal uh, scanning and support uh, under the connection. I can do two-factor authentication as well here. So I can do the multi-factor also. And speaking of FS logics, I've mentioned that a couple of times today. If you're not aware of what that is, that's a profile management system, a very robust available from Microsoft. We've always had support for it. So you can always download and install it separately from Microsoft. However, um, we've added some optimizations and integrations in, so it's a little bit more seamless an experience with Parallels. Microsoft does give it away for free, provided you have a remote desktop client access license or a VDA license, and I kind of like free. So that's, um, that's what we recommend you use for profile management. So let's flip over to the server side. Uh, first of all, we need to enable the feature. So to do that, um, we just go up to farm and then settings and then click on features and then just kind of turn it on, right? And you got a few different options here. I can, um, I can just install it manually. I could install it from an online. I could install it from a network share or I could push it out from the RAS agent. You know, some of those you do have to download and copy it out first. I usually just do online because it's a lot easier. So, or at least less steps that I need to do, not necessarily easier. So I'll do that. Um, we do support a couple of different versions. You can pick the version of FS logics that you are going to use. Um, just kind of make your choice there, whichever one you like. I'll just go with this one for now, and then we click apply. Okay, the next step would be to go back over to the RD session hosts under farm RD session host, and then I'm just going to modify this to the group setting. So this is a way to do it to an existing environment already. So I'll go into the groups, I'll go into user profile, and um, instead of doing it for the whole site, I'm going to make sure it applies to just this particular group. Set it to FS Logics, uh, SMB, or Cloud Cache. I'm going to use an SMB location here, and then I've already got a path already set. So it's ready to go, um, really. And then I can change a couple other parameters down here as well, such as the format, the type, the file size. If I go into the properties, you can see that I can set up which users and groups this applies to. I'm just going to let it go for everyone. I can pick which folders should be redirected outside of a user's profile. And then there's also this advanced tab. A lot of these settings are GPO settings. That's how you normally would manage it in, um, in FS Logics, but we have it here so that you um, you can just do it in a single pane of glass so it makes it a lot easier you can kind of scroll down and see all the settings right here so this is what it is uh, to retroactively do it as i click apply however you also can do this as you deploy infrastructure as well so uh, there's a little wizard that'll pop up you saw in the checkbox as you're deploying new systems if you've been installing on version 18 or later and then you can um, actually kick all this off during that, uh, provided you've enabled the feature up there, of course. And it works across all the platforms that we support. So it does it for RD Session Host, but also for VDI and um, Windows WVD as well. Another set of tools that we've added, that you've seen me skip through also, was the automated image optimizations. Um, you, this pops up as a wizard, just like FS Logics is one of the wizard screens as your um, deploying new infrastructure, WVD, VDI, RDSH, um, but you also can retroactively do that. So let's go ahead and do that in my environment right here. So beginning with version 18, Parallels RAS included some built-in automated optimization capabilities for remote desktop session hosts, VDI, WVD workloads. Uh, there's different pre-configured optimizations, whether you're using multi-session or single session, like an RDS session host versus a VDI, for instance. Um, that way you can automatically ensure you get a more efficient, streamlined, and improved delivery of the virtual apps and desktops. These optimizations were designed to be easily updated to support future releases of Windows, and you also can use custom scripts in there as well. I think there's over 130 different optimizations that, that you could use or implement. 
It's okay. So the deployment wizard will take you to the screen. Otherwise, you can come back and do it uh, manually. You check enable optimization. You can set it to automatic or manual. Automatic will obviously choose the best on the type of resource it is, VDI or uh, remote desktop server, WVD. Uh, if you choose manual, then you can kind of scroll down here and look at what all they are. If you click on them individually, it gives you a little bit of a description. There's also a description for them in the administrator guide. And down at the bottom there, you can see where you can implement a custom script. And since I was already in the screen, let me get out of it. I'll cancel. And you can see if you just go to remote desktop session host and click on site defaults and optimization, you can go ahead and implement it. You can go to the group level, the site level, or cherry pick individual servers. Okay, and we're winding down here. Uh, just a couple of more little things. One of them is we have a, an advanced UX or user experience evaluator and advanced session details uh, that you can get in. It gives you a bunch of new metrics and a bunch of great ways to kind of figure out uh, exactly what's going on with your end user experience there. So let me switch back over to uh, the Graz console again. And if I go into the session management, the session, you can see all these new metrics that are available up here that you can kind of get into and um, really experience, and including the experience evaluator, which gives you some of the latency settings, uh, the transport protocol they're using, the session length, um, just a wealth of information. And what's really cool is you can drill down even further. So if I right click on this one and go to uh, full screen, you can uh, see much more uh, detail and a little bit easier in terms of what's going on across the entire experience. And then if I right click again and go into show information, now I've got a lot of detail about any individual user and what's going on. I can even export it and send it out to a file that you can evaluate later or ship off somewhere, whatever it is you need to do. You can see the connection quality, the latency, bandwidth available all sorts of stuff. So very, very cool and a very powerful tool here. Uh, you can even see the connection mode and type, gateway mode, SSL, um, you know, the authenticated just using credentials as opposed to two-factor authentication or something like that. I mean, there's just a ton of information as we kind of look down through here, um, you know, how long it took to load the user profile, <laughs> the desktop load time. Um, just everything. So you can really, it's not just what the end users are telling you, you can kind of see it. Okay, last couple of quick hits here. The first one, um, we now have the ability for remote desktop server and VDI distribution to local uh, storage. Essentially, that means if you're cloning uh, images, you know, and you have separate data stores in your hypervisor image, such as uh, separate Hyper-V servers, uh, we can kind of treat storage as one, so you don't have to copy the uh, template to every single local storage. We can have it in one place and then deploy across uh, all the local storage. Okay, and then this is a really cool feature, the accelerated file retrieval. Essentially, um, up until version 18, we were relying on just the basic RDP file transfer stuff. Right? It could take a long time to actually upload, download files, browse even your local file system uh, from a remote app or from a VDI instance or whatever. We've dramatically improved that. And to do that, I want uh, to demonstrate that. I've got a quick little uh, video here I'm going to show you. Okay, so on the left is the drive redirection cache off, right? Native RDP or parallels RAS without the drive cache, right? So, or maybe an older version of RAS, and on the right, it's turned on. And you can see just the dramatic difference between these two. Just to enumerate the file system and be able to browse the files on the left without that cache turned on, it took um, five and a half, almost six minutes to do that. On the right, we're able to do that in less than a minute. And then once we're actually in the folder system, once it's cached, um, you can see how very quickly we can kind of browse, save files, um, and so forth. I think this video actually kicks off in a moment where it's just scrolling up and down the file tree. I mean, look how quick that is once it kind of got set. So a dramatic improvement um, that's now available out here starting again in version 18. Hey, and uh, with that, guess what? We're done. Congratulations. We, we made it, right? Um, it was a long, uh, long session, but we got through it. We covered a lot of material. Uh, there will be links, of course, to the recording and the slide deck as well. I maintain that in a Dropbox. So you'll have all that information available to you um, 
probably the email will come out in a day or so. Should usually doesn't take too long. Um, also, there'll be a link to a survey. Please fill out the survey. Let us know um, how we're doing here, um, and fill it out honestly. You're you're not going to hurt my or my feelings. You're not going to get me into trouble by uh, giving us some honest feedback. I know it was a lot of information. Um, but with the video and the slide deck, you can kind of go back and maybe rewatch the highlights, right? I'm sure everybody would like to do that. So um, that'll be available for you. And then, of course, uh, please take the certification exam if you're one of our partners. OK, so and again, that exam information is out on the partner portal. You just log into the partner portal and um, kind of browse through there and you'll be, be able to find it. I think there's a link to it in the follow up email as well. And now we are truly done because I've got nothing else to say, which is good. I'm kind of starting to lose my voice a little bit, but um, thank you all so much for attending. Uh, thank you for being Parallels partners and customers. Um, I'm going to hang around for a little bit and leave the WebEx open just in case there's uh, any questions that I missed or any more that you want to put in there. Just go ahead and use the chat or the Q&A function will answer them there. Uh, but the audio portion is over. So thanks so much, everybody, for attending. Have a great day. Okay, and that seems to be the end of the uh, questions. So thanks again, everybody. Uh, have a great day. I'm going to go ahead and close the WebEx. All right, bye now.